Welcome everyone. And for those who joined us for yesterday's discussions, welcome back. We had more than 240 participants with us live yesterday and many others following along on social media. My name is Nancy Carter and I will be your moderator for today. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are again joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. I am the Chief Financial Officer at Canary, and for the past two years, I have had the distinct privilege of chairing the Multi-Stakeholder Committee that is the organizing brain behind the Canadian Internet Governance Forum. As you heard yesterday, the CIGF is one of the more than 120 national, regional, and youth initiatives that are recognized by the Global Internet Governance Forum. I don't know about everybody else, but I know my mind was spinning last night thinking about the discussions of yesterday. One question we might all be wrestling with after yesterday is, how do we regulate and govern technology in a way that's fit for Canadian society? I'd encourage you to keep the discussions from yesterday going today by the chat function and social media. A few quick logistical notes for those of you who are just joining us today. Next slide, please. Most of you are joining us today via our interactive webcast. We're also streaming the CIGF via YouTube and Facebook Live. Much of the event will take place in English, but French simultaneous translation will also be available. For those of you on the webcast, if you're currently listening in English, but would rather tune in on the French version, click on your initials in the top right corner of the webpage and a drop down menu will appear. Click on set language. A pop up menu will appear, allowing you to navigate to the French site. Regardless of the language you're listening to, you will always be able to ask your questions to our speakers in either language. If you're joining via YouTube, just check out the Canadian IGF channel. Both streams are available. Similarly, we have live streams in both languages available from the Canadian IGF Facebook page. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take uh, questions for the speakers and panelists from participants on the social streams. For those on the interactive webcast page, if you want to ask a question to a speaker or panelist, there's a tab labeled questions on the left hand side of your web page. Once your question has been submitted and approved, everyone will then have a chance to see your question and upvote those they like most. This way, the most relevant questions get asked of our panelists and presenters, and you can interact with those questions. You'll also note there's a chat window on the left side of the web page. Here's where you can interact with your fellow attendees throughout the panels and presentations. While we really encourage uh, discussions in the virtual room, we always encourage you to take this discussion outside the event and to social media. Use the hashtag for the event, hashtag CIGF2020. If you're having technical issues, click the tech support tab on the lower left side of the web page for troubleshooting options. And with all that behind us, let's just jump into day two. Next slide, please. First, we have a message from Philippe André Rodriguez from Global Affairs Canada. Philippe is a fellow member on the Canadian IGF Steering Committee. Philippe comes to us today with a message about Canada's diplomatic efforts and engagement with civil society and the private sector to support internet freedom. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, and good afternoon, all. My name is Philippe André Rodriguez. I am the Deputy Director at the Center for International Digital Policy at Global Affairs Canada. It is my distinct pleasure to be with you today and share a few short remarks before I turn the floor over to the keynote um, that we are all looking forward to. The topics the Canadian IGF is discussing over these two days, from content moderation, encryption, digital literacy to governance of artificial intelligence are some of the most important in terms of the future of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. From where we sit at Global Affairs Canada, ensuring that the approaches of governments and industry to the development and governance of emerging technologies uphold and reinforce Canadian values such as gender equality, diversity, and inclusion is a foreign policy priority. 
We work to develop rights respecting and inclusive approaches to digital tech and advocate these approaches globally at the G7, G20, UN, OECD, and elsewhere and through Canada's most recent endeavor, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, which was just launched last June. Canadians should be proud that one of the uh, Global Partnership on AI's two international centers of expertise is in Montreal, where crucial work on responsible AI and data governance is based. I'm here today to talk about another Canadian leadership uh, in, an, in another forum, the Freedom Online Coalition, which we helped to found almost 10 years ago, and where we continue to advance Canadian priorities through international cooperation. The FOC is a group of 32 governments from every continent who are united by the principle that the human rights people have offline must be protected online, and together advocate for rights respecting online spaces and digital technologies in multiple international forums. A key component of the coalition's operation is the inclusion of non-governmental internet stakeholders through its advisory network, which includes academic, private sector, and civil society members. In the past two years alone, the FOC has collaborated to release five joint statements on defending civic space online, promoting digital inclusion, protecting human rights and cybersecurity law practices and policies, upholding internet freedom in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and protecting human rights in AI use and development. Each of these joint statements includes specific steps the coalition member countries have committed themselves to and encourage other states to follow. The latest joint statement on AI and human rights is a result of ongoing Canadian leadership and international collaboration and reflects both Canada and fellow coalition members' concerns about AI's role in rising digital authoritarianism. While we know that AI tech themselves are not in inherently dangerous, nor a panacea for the challenges facing humanity, there are legitimate and serious risks to human rights posed by the way they can be developed and used. This is especially concerning in authoritarian contexts, where existing human rights violation can be rapidly scaled up through the use of AI. In particular, we have seen remote biometric identification, including facial recognition technology, used without notice or consent in public spaces, in ways that enable the violation of the rights to freedom of religion or belief, freedom of association, peaceful assembly, and liberty of movement. Authoritarian regimes are also forcing platforms to use con automated content moderation to prevent and censor the sharing and dissemination of content online, threatening the right to freedom of expression, including the right to seek, receive, and impart information of all kinds, and the freedom to hold opinions without interference. To address this threat, Canada launched a task force on human rights and AI, the TFAIR, as we, as we call it, at the FOC in early 2020, where we work with over 30 countries, academic industry, and civil society experts. After consultation with global experts in global civil society, the task force launched a joint statement earlier this month. Its 10 call to action present an alternative, whole of government, and whole of society approach to AI governance, requiring multi-stakeholder collaboration with civil society and the private sector. We call on all governments to ensure that any measures that affect online platforms are consistent with international law to protect human rights when procuring, developing, and using AI in the public sector through measures such as due diligence and impact assessments, to encourage the private sector to observe responsible business conducts in the use of AI, to analyze how existing legislation, regulation, and policies can identify, prevent, and mitigate risks to human rights, to facilitate research into AI's potential impacts on human rights, and finally, to promote AI education to enable wider citizen engagement on these issues. I now turn to all of you to help us make this vision for AI governance a reality by using the joint statement as an advocacy tool in your own work and following the work of the task force. Reach out to us and let us know where we can collaborate. And with that, I turn it back to you, Nancy. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Philippe. It's great to hear what the federal government is doing on the world stage. And let's see what we can do to support Philippe's work. Next slide, please. Building a trusted internet is paramount. But in an era where AI is increasingly prominent, how do we ensure that we can maintain a citizen-centric internet and also a trusted internet? Our keynote speaker today believes Canada and Canadians can play a key role in this solution and set an example that will have global ripples. Mark Sermon is the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation, 
a global community that does everything from making Firefox to taking stands on issues like online privacy. ARC's biggest focus is building the movement side of Mozilla, rallying the citizens of the web, building alliances with like-minded organizations and leaders, and growing the internet movement. Welcome to the CIGF, Mark. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Even when you're on stage, you forget to unmute. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy. I really appreciate you inviting me. I'm really happy to be here um, at the Can IGF. Um, maybe before we get started, just throw to my first slide. Uh, I am in a different part of Canada than, uh, than Nancy is. As the slide, if it comes up, will show. There we go. Uh, that's where I am. You can actually find my house and knock on my door on that map of Toronto. Uh, and Toronto is the traditional treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugans of the Credit, uh, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. And what's interesting about Toronto is it was by those nations called the Dish with One Spoon Territory, uh, where those nations both protected that land and shared it. And there was an invitation in that treaty for Europeans and all newcomers to, uh, to join that treaty in the spirit of peace and friendship and respect. And I wanna begin this talk by recognizing and expressing gratitude for that spirit, and also say that we can't make progress on the issues we talk about today in terms of digital rights without also recognizing the rights of indigenous people and reconciling the history of this country. So important to keep that in mind, and then let's move into the talk, because it is, I think, tied to the, the spirit of the talk as well. So next slide. So I want to talk today about AI, uh, governance broadly of AI and the internet, uh, and Canada and our possible role. And uh, I'm going to spend a fair bit of the talk talking about what many of you will know uh, came out last week, which is a proposed Consumer Privacy Protection Act, which many have called Canada's GDPR. I think it's a good background for this conversation. And you might see it as a small piece of legislation just about consumer data, but you could also see it as a, a potential constitution or charter for the rights of Canadians in the AI era and the era of big data. And I like to think of it that way because that's something that we need. We need to look at what are our foundational rights uh, in this era. So let's get started. And the next slide, please. Throughout this talk, uh, I'm gonna rely on some Canadians I admire uh, to help us along. And before we even get into the real kind of specifics around AI governance in Canada, I, I wanted to, to talk about Ursula Franklin, uh, who's a, both a, a famous Canadian physicist and researcher, but also a pacifist and an activist, and someone who inspired me uh, she taught at the University of Toronto, of course. And in 1989, uh, Dr. Franklin gave a, a lecture, gave the Massey Lectures, uh, and it was entitled The Real World of Technology. And I always find in, in you know, talking about the things we're going to talk about today, it's really helpful for me to ground in, in some of the concepts in that talk. And in particular, Dr. Franklin talked about the difference between what she called holistic technologies technologies that really uh, were artisans or craftspeople control their own work. And I often think about open source and the early internet and the blogger movement as being about that holistic technology. People who had control over where they wanted the technology to go, they may work together, but there was a lot of agency. And she also talked about prescriptive technologies, which, you know, things like factories where there was a sequence of steps or bureaucracies for that matter, uh, broken down uh, and supervised by bosses and managers. And I think increasingly the internet is something that pervades all of our lives and reflects that prescriptive technology pattern. And one of the quotes from, from the book, uh, which actually I, I have here to, to wave on screen of the real world of technology, and it, it's very dog-eared from my many years of referencing it, uh, is, is to kind of think about this quote. Uh, well, we should not forget that these prescriptive technologies are exceedingly effective and efficient. They bring a lot to us. They also come with an enormous social mortgage. The mortgage means that we live in a culture of compliance, that we are never, we are ever more conditioned to accept orthodoxy as normal 
and to accept that there is only one way of doing it. And that's, I think, we want to look at different ways of doing it and look at maybe is there a way to have a more holistic view of the technologies and the technological society that we're building. So with that, let us get in uh, to the topic of technology. Uh, and next slide, please. This is my Mad Dash slide. For those of you who remember old Canadian game shows, this one hosted by Pierre Lalonde, and it indicates we are about to do a poll. So before we uh, get started, uh, I want to ask you uh, about how you think about Canada technology and innovation. Um, so if we can bring up the poll, uh, and you can actually click on the left side of your screen in order to participate. And the question here is, which Canadian innovations are you, or Canadian innovation are you most proud of? The Canada Arm, the Avro Arrow, or Insulin? And while you're answering, if you don't know what the Canada Arm is, because you're much younger than me, uh, is the arm for the space shuttle that the Canadians contributed. Uh, and the Avro Arrow, of course, was the supersonic jet uh, that, uh, that we invented that the Americans kind of shut down. And you can see the insulin is winning. Please keep clicking if you want. And uh, oh, people are leaning towards the technology which saves lives as opposed to the minor additions to the space shuttle. Uh, I'm not shocked. And uh, maybe just as we get a few more, oh, somebody is proud of the Avro Arrow, which I think is, is, is worth being proud of. Um, and just before we wrap up, and I think I'm gonna wrap up soon, this gives us a, a bit of a sense. Oh, I love watching this unfold. Um, but maybe when we go back, if we can go back to the next slide and not the game show slide, but all right, there we go. So let's just keep that in mind, the pride in insulin as a Canadian uh, innovation. I think certainly one that has saved so many lives and, and is worth being proud of. Uh, so why talk about AI governance uh, in Canada? So first of all, um, you know, why talk about AI? Certainly it's something Mozilla, while being a, an organization focused on the web and freedom on the internet more broadly, uh, is focused on. We, we, a big part of our work is focused on the theme of trustworthy AI uh, right now. And for us, AI is, is broader than just, you know, the automated decisions themselves, but really the current computing environment. The computing environment that's made up of of AI, big data, sensors, all of those things, which much in the way that the web was the materiality, that the thing that was shaping computing as Mozilla started in the late 90s, that world of, of AI is what is deciding where computing goes and where our digital society goes uh, at this stage. And of course, you know, like we just heard from Philippe, you know, in, there's a lot of, a lot of times when we think about AI, we think about technologies like facial recognition, we think about authoritarian regimes, we think about things like bias and the mis misidentification of people. In particular, you know, facial recognition often misidentifies people with dark skin. We think about police and government. Um, it's important that we look at the governance of AI and, and how we want our societies to use AI in those contexts. But next slide. I think it's also important to just remember AI is, comes in many, many other forms that may seem more innocuous. Um, you know, it really is that everything we use every day from our, our phones to an Alexa to content feeds we get on, on YouTube or Facebook are driven by automation and frankly are driven by our data. The fuel of a, modern AI is our data, it's a core part of the computing platform. The software, the experiences, the things we use every day, the, the code just doesn't run uh, without our data. And that is sort of why I'm gonna to touch a little bit later on the, on the uh, Consumer Privacy Act. We are the fuel of the modern AI environment. And that environment makes decisions about what content we see, whether we get a loan, uh, it unlocks our phones for us has a bigger and bigger role in shaping our lives. And so how it works matters. Uh, and I think that is a reason that we should pay attention to it, not just in those scary scenarios, but in all of our everyday lives. Next slide, please. And so that's why I wanna talk about uh, the governance of AI. Uh, and, and it fits into the broader questions of, of, of internet governance that IGF has been talking about since 2005. Um, and it is a time 
for those conversations about governance of the digital world to become more real. And, and it, that time actually has been recognized. Governments around the world are much more serious uh, about building or developing policy and laws related to the governance of the digital world. But, um, you know, we actually still do generally live in a world much like the one uh, where the World Summit on the Information Society, where this conversation of, of the Internet Governance Forum started in 2003 and 2005, um, you know, we're still in the same spot where the Internet is generally governed in a very light way, and we're quite immature about it. And when I think back to that initial World Summit on the Information Society, which, which as Henriette Esterhuizen said yesterday, is what uh, begat the IGF in the first place, really it was, um, I mean, I, I remember walking around the, that summit in Tunis. Um, it really was a talk shop and a showpiece. You saw, um, you know, government economic development agencies giving out caviar. You saw, um, you know, cell phone towers being sold by, by big companies. It wasn't really about the questions of governance and where it was, it was talk. But now actually we have come to a time, and I think the IGF has been holding the space where we need to answer the questions about governance. Um, and not just about how do we control the technology, but how do we enable it to help us? So that's why AI and why governance is the focus of this talk. And then next slide, why Canada? Um, I think that at this moment of reckoning and, and the need to really get serious about internet governance and the governance of things like AI, Canada potentially plays a tremendously powerful role. We have a history of people who are visionary thinkers about values and technology and where technology and communication should go, whether that's Ursula Franklin, people like Harold Innes, people like Marshall McLuhan, a lot of the way, certainly I think, but I think many who reflect on and think about the global landscape of technology and values uh, have been inspired by thinking in Canada. And we have a history of visionary policy in communications, whether it is uh, Wilfrid Laurier and the Railway Act intervening to make sure that our national phone network was affordable and interconnected when the private companies involved at the time uh, weren't necessarily taking it in that direction and that, that rural communities had access that was affordable. Whether it is Mackenzie King's government and the creation of the National Film Board, uh, many of the things that came up under the Pierre Elliott Trudeau related to Canadian content and the distribution and funding of Canadian voices. We not only have big thinkers in the history of Canada and technology, but we have the history of visionary policy. But it really has been 40 or 50 years, I would argue, since we have said, here's what we believe in, here's how communication affects the fabric of our society, and here's how we want to build a policy uh, environment that reflects that. And I think now is a time for us to do that, as a time where we can do it in a way that maybe the world can look to and we can shape uh, where things go. So that's, uh, that's a bit of a tee up for why I wanna look at our proposed privacy legislation because I think it, it could be uh, a first in a long time visionary piece of policy, but although it needs to go a little further. So let's just go to the next slide. Uh, of course, Canadians like their values-driven policy, and I think we have a, an excellent Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and you know, it's something that, as a Canadian, I feel strongly about. Next slide. And so it was great to see that back in May, Mr. Baines came out with Canada Digital Charter. Of course, not as binding as our actual uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, not binding at all. Um, but next slide. Similar to the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it did set out a set of values for what a policy agenda in Canada related to the digital society, including things like AI, uh, could look like. And, you know, there's a lot of, of fine statements or kind of the right topics in there, universal access, strong democracy, uh, an open and modern digital government. If you want to go to the next slide. But there's three in there that I found particularly hopeful and also really wanted to see us as Canadians pursue. And those are uh, the three that are up there on the slide, control and consent, transparency, portability, and interoperability, and strong enforcement and real accountability. And why I pull those out is those are key areas that 
around the world we've been discussing and experimenting with as topics that really matter in how digital the digital world works out for all of us. And they sound very abstract, but they're, they're quite important. So if you imagine back to that Amazon Alexa that the dog was, um, you know, that the dog was ordering food from a little bit earlier in the slide deck, um, think about these abstract concepts in relationship to that relationship with the, that relationship to the Alexa. So con consent, turning on a mic and collecting data, you want to feel like that's something that's happening because you want it to. Uh, and, you know, we do a lot to say, hey, Alexa, hey, Siri, and it feels like it's consent, but we actually want to make sure that we really trust that there is consent for being listened to and to our data being collected. And we want to make sure that that's something legally we can expect. Control, we want to control who gets that data. We don't want Amazon or Apple or anyone just sharing it willy-nilly uh, without us feeling like it's in our interest and we know why. Transparency, if something happens that we don't like with that data and that interaction, uh, we want to be able to see why it happened, um, which right now we really can't. If you get some weird ad, was it because Alexa was listening to you talking about a pair of running shoes or, or did they just guess it some other way? There's no way really to kind of look in and see that. And then portability, the idea that you can leave Amazon and go to Google or go to a great privacy-friendly Canadian startup uh, with your services by taking your data with you is something we hope we would have and should be a right, uh, but isn't a reality in today's world. And of course, uh, accountability, if all else fails, if you really feel your data has been abused, you have been abused, these rights have been abused, uh, you wanna be able to make sure that someone is held accountable. And, you know, it's not just about that one interaction with the Alexa, but we all interact with multiple devices, dozens of uh, companies, thousands of interactions every day. And so if you imagine that that is the world we live in, the idea of having a constitution or a charter of rights for this world uh, feels to me really, really important. So let's get into, you know, concretely how we might think about that and, and the, the proposed privacy law. But before that, if you want to go to the next slide, every time you see this next slide, we get another poll. So if we can go to the next poll and you can click on that left hand as, as well. Um, so the question is, which is the most important element of the digital charter to you? And of the three I talked about, people controlling their own data, data being portable and interoperable, or real accountability for companies that hold those data. And according to the top right of my slide, you have 20 seconds left to answer. Oh, people jump right in. Ooh, people controlling their data and accountability out front as uh, the kind of two leading places that people have talked about. Oh, it's kind of edging closer to those two topics. Um, and it is interesting that, you know, the data portability and the choice piece is, is low, but the two places that are really about personal agency and, pers and accountability for companies are neck and neck. And I, th I actually do think those are the two key questions of our time that any law like this, any constitution or charter of rights for the digital world uh, need to address at a top level. Oh, accountability is edging ahead. Well, we'll let the poll continue and we'll go on to the next slide. That's gonna be helpful as we talk about uh, these other topics. So to just go back to insulin uh, for a second, um, you know, it, it really is important whether we're talking about a law or we're talking about a, an actual piece of technology that is operating uh, to think about ideas going into action. And, and just the digital charter that came out last May was really in the realm of ideas. And of course, the power of something like insulin isn't the idea of curing diabetes or fighting uh, diabetes, but it is actually the hard work and the research and the invention, um, as well as bringing that invention into the world. And so really what we need to see happen with the digital charter uh, is that it comes into the world in a way that really gives Canadians the kinds of rights we need and actually opens up the sort of business and, and innovation environment that we need in order to have a digital world that we trust. Next slide. And so, uh, you know, it, it's nice that just the week before this talk, 
uh, a long awaited proposal for our new Canadian privacy uh, legislation came out and it was called the Digital Charter Implementation Act. And um, Vass Bedner uh, was helping me write this talk and we were wondering whether this would come out um, and, it, and we we're gonna talk about the charter no matter what. And it is gonna, it was, it was great to see it come out because it's good, but also really speaks to the point of taking those principles and putting them into action. Uh, and as Cory Doctorow's quote tweet here says, many have talked about this as being akin uh, to the GDPR. And what I wanna do, because it's data is so critical to AI and the society we live in, is kind of just go through, through three pieces of, of, the, um, of the proposed law. Well, actually two. One is some things that are good around how accountability, which was sort of 50%, I actually I think was the, the winner in our poll at 52%. Um, some things that are good around accountability, some things that are promising in terms of digital rights, but also what's missing. Uh, and what's missing is really the recognition that data rights and digital rights aren't just personal, they're collective. And without an effective mechanism uh, for collective expression of these rights, I don't think this new law is gonna work. And it's actually one of the reasons that GDPR is failing uh, to have the kind of effect it needs. And if we can add that, which I think we still can, we can blaze a trail in terms of what digital governance really should look like. So next slide. First to talk about something that's good in the law. And as I said, I'm gonna lean on some can, uh, Canadians I respect. This is Anne Kavukian, who, who many of you may know as the former Information Privacy Commissioner of Ontario uh, and kind of the, the coiner or one of the coiners of the concept of privacy by design, that we should build privacy into the, the technologies we create right from the start. And also, you know, I, and in all the time that, that I've known her has been uh, an advocate for better accountability and for governance structures and systems that can stand for the privacy rights of, of people and for of Canadians. Next slide. Um, and so it wasn't surprising to see her tweeting when the, the new proposed legislation came out. Um, and really f recognizing that it is a good beginning in terms of where Canada and Canadians um, need to go, could go. Uh, next slide. And in particular, you know, she focused on the fact that the new privacy legislation will give the privacy commissioner explicit powers for order making. And that, you know, that's a, a kind of particular term. Uh, and what it means in the context of the proposal is that the commissioner could force organizations to comply with requests, like say, hey, you know, this is what the law says, Amazon Alexa needs to change this, or say, stop collecting data or stop using personal information. So it is a strong accountability, which I know in the, in the consultations leading up to the, the privacy law revision, strong accountability uh, was something that really was at the top of the list of what Canadians asked for. So it's amazing to see that in there. And it also includes the potential for uh, heavy fines for people who, uh, who, who break the law up to 5% of global revenue or 25 million Canadian, whichever uh, is greater. So potentially, and as, as uh, Dr. Gavukian recognizes here, What's on the table is something that is strong in terms of accountability. Uh, next slide. She does flag that there's questions around that. One is there's potentially a confusing uh, authority in there between the commissioner being able to make orders and then the idea of there being in an additional tribunal that the commissioner has to go to, I think in particular related to levying fines. So, you know, th there's something very good in the legislation in terms of proposed legislation in terms of the idea of, of accountability and a strong mechanism for it. But also there are that, a bunch to be worked out there. I would say the other critical thing, and for those of us who wanna watch this and, and see this be successful, uh, that, that wasn't raised by Dr. Kavukian and I haven't really seen in the debate, is really the piece around resourcing. A, a huge failure in terms of GDPR having impact is that the data protection authorities in different countries across Europe just don't have the resources to deal with the volume of complaints and questions that, that are brought to them. So if Canada is serious about accountability, and I think we can 
uh, as one country that's reasonable in, in size show you know, kind of a, a best in breed in terms of accountability on these issues. It also means very seriously building an arm of government resource to properly deal with this uh, and not taking years and years of having a, a small unit of people who, who can't, uh, you know, who can't take the demand and sort through the questions that inevitably will come as a society as we metabolize these new laws. And, and that'll take, you know, five, 10, 10 years. So a, a promising start on accountability, a lot to be sorted out. And I think in particular, focusing on the resourcing being serious, because otherwise it doesn't matter that it is in the law. Next slide. The, the next uh, Canadian who I admire um, is Cory Doctorow, who many of you know uh, probably as a science fiction author or as the, the co-editor of the Boing Boing blog. Uh, and this is Cory on like Wand Day or something. I don't know where I found this picture of him, but it, it delighted me. Um, and uh, of course, you know, one of the things if you follow Cory's career, I remember him like early in the Toronto web development community before he he moved uh, to London and, and put out a bunch of books, uh, is he has always been a huge advocate for the idea that we need digital rights and that digital rights are actually gonna be critical to how society works out. And he's kind of warned us about the sort of prescriptive technology world that we might, uh, we might land in. Um, and so, you know, as we get into this topic where people are taking the idea of digital rights seriously, as a core part of what we need in our society. Corey is somebody who really has kind of guided me and I look to in that. Um, and next slide. And so, it, you know, it's not surprising or certainly made me happy that Corey as a, as a Canadian expat living in London uh, jumped on Twitter right as the, the, new, um, the new proposed privacy law was released and highlighted that one of its strengths, one of the things that's promising about it is that it does talk in terms of a set of digital rights similar to what GDPR or, or the California equivalent or the Kenyan equivalent or, or others around the world uh, do. And then we're starting to now be able to have a conversation about what rights should we have as Canadians uh, in relationship in the digital world, not just in relationship to our data. Um, and you know, two of the he flags are the right to, um, to have your data deleted you know, whether it's stuff you post to, to, to Facebook, not just that you can delete it, but it actually can be gone from their, their servers, which is, is a fairly obvious one. But also the idea that you can opt out, that you can refuse to have your data collected. And, and that really talks to where these rights kind of get to the real materiality and, and how we will live with AI and automation. Uh, in the, if you imagine right now that all of these computing systems run on our data. And you know, if you take Facebook without the data or you take Google without the data, it's like taking computer and, and taking the microprocessor, the CPU out of it. it. It's a core part of how the system runs as we talked about. And if we talk about having the right to refuse to have our data collected and used, it actually has the potential if enough people exercised it to really look at how we would change the architecture of, of how this works. Maybe it means that if enough people opt out, uh, as has happened with, with Apple and some things Mozilla does, people start uh, playing with um, AI models where the data stays on the device and never goes to some central um, computing system in the cloud to be, to be processed. Or, or other things where we actually imagine technology changing for the better because of those rights. Next slide. Michael Geist also, uh, and many of you will know him uh, as, a, as a commentator on, on kind of Canadian internet and privacy law uh, at the University of Ottawa, um, also talked about you know, some of the things that are there in terms of the rights in the proposed new law. And I think he talked about data portability, which sadly only got 6% 6, 6 in our poll, but I think is critical in terms of people having choice and there being competition. If we want to imagine Canadian companies being successful in, in consumer internet technology without data portability, that's not possible. But also data portability is key to the idea that if data is the fuel of AI and modern computing, 
that it's not only the province of, of the biggest companies who can collect it all, but we can move our data around to different providers. Um, and, and that is key to not having kind of monopolies in, in AI and, and in the technology universe. And then of course, the idea of having algorithmic transparency, which hasn't yet worked out in the GDPR, nobody's really proven that that is a right that can be exercised in a meaningful way, but is critical if we want accountability. Transparency is really the sibling of accountability, even just in terms of my own personal ability to understand what happened with an algorithmic decision. Um, but also, of course, when we talk about real cases where, where the privacy commissioner would step in and drive accountability. So a lot is promising to see these called out as rights in a proposed piece of law. It, it's not trivial to imagine that and we shouldn't just kind of let it float by even though we say seen it in GDPR or CCPA or other places. It is to me exciting to see that show up as we look at modernizing our privacy law. Next slide. But I think both for policymakers and all of us in the public, acknowledging that we're talking about fundamental rights and connecting them to human rights is and taking them as seriously as human rights and our rights and freedoms in the in the charter is something we critically need to do at this juncture and Teresa Scassa also at University of Ottawa uh, called this out on Twitter as as the law came out and it really we need a constitution or a charter of rights for the digital world and we should really be taking this that seriously so next slide and my last piece on this and it's not to look to a single Canadian, but a set of Canadians. Uh, here we have the Grain Growers Cooperative, uh, which was founded by Edward Partridge in 1906, but also representing you know, a long history of the cooperative movement in Canada. Um, and you know, of course, we, many people will be familiar with the fact that Canada has a deep history in consumer cooperatives, farmers cooperatives, as, as we have here financial cooperatives like credit unions, housing cooperatives. And, you know, I was kind of looking for inspiration. Like how does that connect to now and, and where did it come from? And, and Edward Partridge, who, who founded this grain growers cooperative in Saskatchewan, talked about cooperation as being a weapon against the financial buccaneers, as he called them. And I think looking at where cooperation fits in as we try to counterbalance the imbalance of power in the digital world uh, is, is really something that could unlock things that we have not yet, yet unlocked. So next slide. And that's where there is something just hugely missing uh, from the, the proposed legislation. And that's missing the fact that protecting individual data isn't enough. That the harms are collective and the nature of data is collective. And a number of people have talked about this, but in, in particular, a colleague of mine, Martin Tisney, who, who's at the Luminate uh, Foundation in London, has written about this uh, in a paper, um, which is called The Data Delusion, and certainly worth checking out. And if you go to the next slide, um, in The Data Delusion, Martin talks about how the collective nature of big data means that people are more impacted by others' data than just the data about them. Uh, and so like climate change, the threat is societal and personal. And the GDPR and certainly the, what the proposed Canadian legislation really just frames privacy and our data as a personal issue and doesn't look at the societal sets of questions. Uh, and, and that's something that can change and should change. And, and as I'll talk about in a second, is starting to be looked at different, uh, differently in other more recent uh, consumer privacy legislation. And just a, a couple of quotes from Martin's paper. I mean, he talks about um, you know, the idea that in the era, the era of machine learning of AI, um, that that effectively renders individual denial of consent meaningless. So when Corey talked in the previous set of slides about saying I can opt out, that doesn't actually matter because if I refuse being on Facebook or Twitter or Amazon, the fact that everybody around me is in those places means that the, the broader social effects still affect me because I have other data connections to those people and there is so much data sharing. And so Martin recommends in the paper, the idea that our societies need collective and individual data rights, similar to non-discrimination law, which covers both individuals and groups. 
And so I, I do think if we want to have visionary privacy law, law that serves as a charter of rights for our life as Canadians in the digital world, adding those collective rights into the final legislation is critical. And next slide. Uh, and so, you know, I, I try to see, look for a tweet to, um, to kind of make that point, but in the end, I, I just decided to write one as my kind of own weighing in on the topic, um, which really we are missing that idea of collective data rights and that we need to look at how the law can include ways to exercise uh, rights collectively. And so I, I, there's a couple of things in that um, just to kind of bring it to life and, and make it less abstract. One is seeing the scope of these rights as, as collective. And that's something that can happen in the framing of a law like this. But the other more simple thing, and we've seen this in the Canadian consumer privacy um, laws, the CCPA, uh, is to build in acts, sorry, build in mechanisms that allow us to act collectively. And that's not a difficult thing to do. The GDPR actually hints at it and the, the CCPA is clearer which is to allow us to delegate our rights to a, a, a bigger party who can act on all of our behalves collectively. And so the CCPA has something called an authorized agent where they can act on my right to deletion or my desire to, to see an algorithmic explanation uh, as well as that on many people. And, and so just you know, stop for a second and imagine uh, you're feeling that your right to move your data around isn't being respected, or you want an explanation for something that happened. What is the likelihood you're going to write to the privacy commissioner and, and try to ask to get that fixed? And what's the likelihood that that's going to have an impact, even if you get redress on the overall system being more fair for all Canadians? It's very low, at least for me. I, I know I wouldn't do it. And then maybe and imagine a slightly better situation, like you have a 10 or 100 or 1,000 of your friends and neighbors who feel the same way. It's like this data portability thing's gotta be fixed or like this discriminatory bank algorithm, I, I don't like it, how it's using our data. But even if you had that 1,000 friends and neighborhoods, what's the likelihood they will all act? And what's the likelihood that that is gonna add up to a real change and have impact? But then imagine uh, in the same situation, you've got those thousand friends or maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, and you all belong to something like a credit union that looks after your data or at least your data rights. And that when it sees those complaints coming in from its members or just even observes problems, it can act collectively on those hundreds or thousands or millions of members. Uh, what's the likelihood there that you'll get redress or that things will change? It's actually much greater. And the thing is that, you know, we can't rely on, or, or many people have criticized things like GDPR for relying on citizens to do all the work. And uh, of course, you know, we need to be able to exercise our rights, but having some way we can delegate and collectivize built in to the CPPA as has happened in California could make a huge difference. And I would say this is the one thing that if we're gonna change anything, add anything, to the proposed legislation, it would be a difference maker that would put us ahead of the world. There is no federal legis legislation, national legislation anywhere that has this. So next slide. Coming to the end, I, I would say, you know, we have an opportunity as we look at how we want to govern the world of data and AI and the digital world we all live in. And it is to really just talk in the abstract as it felt like we did at WSIS 15 years ago about how we might wanna do this or move into something that actually changes the world as, as we do by following through on an invention of something like insulin. And I think in order to do that, it's not just uh, taking what others have done in things like the GDPR and bringing them into a Canadian context. It's putting real money behind the accountability mechanisms that we're talking about it's digging into and making real the rights that we are starting to talk about in the proposed legislation. But most importantly, I think it's about adding a, a mechanism for collective action and giving the Canadians the right to delegate and join cooperatives, data trusts, other things uh, that allow them to, to make this act real. And I think without that, 
in any jurisdiction, um, we're not going to be able to create the balance of power between citizens and, and the tech industry. And with that, and I think Canada could easily do it, we could carve a way, uh, carve a path that really would be visionary tech policy of the kind that Canada really deserves and, and that would inspire the world. So next slide, second last slide. Um, of course, we have lots of raw material for that. And these are my final Canadians, two of them are Canadians. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Yashua Benjo in the middle and the and the right, at least the way I'm looking at the screen, um, who of course are, are two of three Turing Prize winners from a couple of years ago who, who make huge advances in uh, in deep learning and, and AI. Um, and and of course, you know, we have invested a tremendous amount in AI research and have a tremendous amount of horsepower. So that's great. But without that turning into the right laws and the right way for us to express that technology in a way that makes it real and good for Canadians. And without then us building businesses that provide real services that work and respect those rights, but also then can be exported to the world uh, because these kinds of laws are gonna be everywhere. Uh, without making it real, getting into real law and having real businesses based on Canadian values, I worry that we're gonna take all of that research, all of that horsepower, and it's just gonna kind of dissipate and not go anywhere. So I think we have a real choice to make here as Canadians. And, and you know, as, as boring as it may sound, uh, our privacy law and what we do with it may be a, a critical part of uh, whether things work out or, or not uh, in terms of something exciting and visionary. So just one last poll, uh, and um, I think I know what you're gonna say. But uh, if things go well, the future of Canadian AI innovation and law will be most like the Canada arm, the Avro era, or insulin. And we have less time for this. I'm only giving you 15 seconds. Click on the left side. Let's see, what, will anybody answer? Nobody cares. Uh, either that or nobody clicked. So let's, oh, they did. And oh. People actually, more people said the Canada on this side. So uh, I actually still hope that the future of Canadian AI innovation will be more like insulin. Oh, it's starting to shift. Uh, I do think our values can be manifest in the technology, in products, in services, in laws. Uh, and that, that you know that's where Canada can contribute to the world and the questions we're discussing here at the Canadian IGF and around the world. And let me just have one last slide and then I'll throw it back to Alyssa, is to bring us back to Ursula Franklin. Uh, Ursula Franklin in the real world of technology in, in her Massey lecture uh, asked us, well, she didn't ask us, she said, we should ask of technology a set of seven questions. And I won't read them all, I'll just read a couple of them. But we should ask whether technology promotes justice, whether it favors people over machines, whether it favors conservation over waste, and whether it favors the reversible over the irreversible. And I think those questions and just the idea that we want a technology that is more holistic than um, prescriptive is something that is attainable for us and is right and actually will be good for ourselves as Canadians and the world. So thank you very much and uh, really appreciate being here. And that's the end of the slides. And there comes yeah. Alyssa. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for that presentation. And I appreciate uh, how challenging that may have been in the, the last couple of weeks with different pieces of the digital charter falling into place kind of in real time, including the privacy legislation that you're talking about, or the, the, the bill that you're talking about. Um, so I have a few questions for you popping up on uh, the questions tool in the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one is, what is Mozilla doing to support digital policy research and advocacy in Canada? Um, we're very, doing very little in Canada, um, and we would like to do more. And we're doing a lot around the world, uh, and particularly in Europe and, um, and the US and on a global stage. We're just about to launch in January something called the Data Futures Lab which is networking people who are looking at alternative data governance models, including cooperatives and trusts. Um, and that will include a piece that is a conversation amongst people who are looking at the governance 
questions and will support research. We've already released some research uh, in this area. But a key piece in how we approach these topics is looking at how you bridge the policy world with the real built environment of technology. So we'll also be funding prototypes by people who take alternative data governance approaches, things like the, the idea that you can collectivize consent and build real products and services that demonstrate them in the real world. Um, as we get that off the ground, and, and we have a number of other initiatives like that uh, as a part of our trustworthy AI work, um, the idea of working more with Canadians is, is something we're really interested in doing. Excellent. All right. Our next uh, most upvoted question is, oh, hold on. That one was retracted because you answered it partway through your presentation. Our next one is, can I or why can't I own my digital identity, the online expression of myself, uh, through my data trails, regardless of who collects them? It's a good question and it's a complicated question. Um, I think the intent behind the question that I, I should own my digital identity uh, and be able to make choices is the, is the thing that a law like this should, should stand for. And of course, you know, cobbling together the ability to do that is something that very few people could do themselves, even if all the right rights existed and all the right capabilities on the platforms exist. And that's where the idea of data cooperatives, data trusts, or, or somehow collectivizing. So we have a, a set of trusted parties, I would argue nonprofit parties that help us own our own and manage our own digital identities um, is something that, that is worth well, I think is worth more than serious consideration I think we need in society. But certainly the idea that we would all have the freedom to join something like that, um, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, government, whatever, uh, I, I think is a critical thing at this juncture. Of course, I, there is a, a set of, um, there's nuance in that the idea of owning, as Martin talks about in the, in the data delusion, owning my data as an individual is a bit of a problem because what actually, how this data works is it's all mixed together in one big pot. And so I think to think about it more about controlling my digital identity uh, and not necessarily that all of the data is what makes that identity, it, it is a kind of gestalt of me. Um, so I think that's the right thing to look at, but to get very, very technical, you know, it's, it's hard to own all of your data in a way that has full meaning given that it's so much of it is about inference and connection to other people's data. Great. Okay, our next question is from Andrew Clement. State security Hi, intelligence Andrew. agencies, uh, such as CSE and the NSA, pose a significant challenge to a charter of digital rights. How can this be addressed in Canada? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question because, it, of course, that we know from Edward Snowden onward that um, the, the mechanisms of commercial surveillance and, and the mechanisms that are used to run um, platforms like Facebook and, and Google uh, and that, that run AI also are the, the, the most common sources um, or are powerful sources for the security agents, um, agencies and that those things can be abused. And I, I think the first thing is to, to ask that question and bring it up in the, the conversation about where our privacy legislation should go. But, but in reality, I think you're always going to have a struggle between individual rights and, and security. And, you know, not to go back to the same thing, but if it's individuals defending themselves in that setting, as opposed to us having some collective representation of data rights, I think you end up in very different situations. And so even if we have all the right debates now, we get all the right things in the law, if we leave individuals out, out there to kind of protect themselves and their data, they're gonna be at a disadvantage and building really an, an approach to collective data rights and, and data rights management um, gives us a better chance in that, in that setting. And the next question comes from uh, Michael Nelson of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And his question is, which countries are doing the right thing, Estonia, any other role models? Yeah, Estonia is doing some things right. I don't know whether or not they have collective data rights in, in a lot. There's a bunch of things that Estonia is, is doing right around digital governance. 
Um, I, I do think that um, Europe is kind of, in general, I realize it's not a country, but as a, as a broader jurisdiction, least carved in the direction, uh, carved a, a path in the direction of data rights, but is missing this collective data rights piece. Uh, and California has, with things like delegation of rights and authorized ag agents, started to, to tee up the possibility of collective data rights. Um, there are some good things in the Kenyan uh, data protection law that the past in the last 18 months, I can't remember if it was last year or, or slightly before that, I think it was last year. Um, but I would say, you know, it, it is something that still is emergent. We know in the, in the Biden administration, it's pretty likely that, um, that the national data protection or privacy legislation will get tabled and whether that waters down what's there in California uh, is, or, or is as strong or stronger. Um, I, I'd be shocked if it was stronger. Um, you know, is in play, and I think we're going to see more and more jurisdictions grappling with this. The idea that Canada could play a role model or be a role model and play a leading role in pushing this uh, field further is, is something I, I think we should really do. Um, and it also is is early, right? If I think back to this, I think about the beginning of the IGF process 15 years ago, there really wasn't a meaningful attempt by governments to figure out how we govern these things. And that now is the case. I mean, government, governments um, may do a horrible job or they may do a good job, but there's gonna be a lot of laws written in the next 10 years about how all this works. And you know, it would be good for Canada to be uh, one of the places that does a good job. I like that answer. It could be a catastrophe. It could be really great. Well, you and, and it's, you know, if we do nothing as the IGF community, it will be a catastrophe. Absolutely. All right, we have three more minutes and I have a few more questions for you. Uh, the next one comes from James Kerr and his question is, has Aaron O'Toole, Conservative Party leader, suggested, suggested any attitude about the digital charter? You like any addition? I have no idea what uh, the Conservatives or any of the other parties have done in reaction. I have, that, that's part of my being a Canadian who doesn't actually always work in Canada and mostly works internationally. I, I haven't looked at the, the direct political reactions yet. Okay. Uh, our next one is, what is Mozilla's stance on the private right of action in Canada's new privacy law? That's a good question. I don't know. Too early Again, to as tell. a Canadian, pardon? Too early to tell? Too early to tell. All right. Uh, our next question comes from David Mackey, and his question is, how do you connect value-based digital policy with technical systems that are not understood by the policymakers? That's a super good, good and juicy and difficult question. Uh, and one of the things that we have worked on for, for years is trying to get more technical expertise into government. Uh, and I, I think that that's critical. Things like the Canadian Digital Service um, and it, you know, I think should should be expanded beyond just the direct delivery of di digital government and, and the being about providing expertise embedded in government, or we should have other ways to do that. Um, it, it's a it's a serious challenge. One of the things that that we've just started in Europe is we've helped with a bunch of other foundations create a, a four and a half million euro European AI fund, which is basically about building AI expertise in civil society so that it's not only corporate lobbyists and, and corporate funded researchers who inform policy. But I, I think there's a bunch we need to do both on the, the outside game, looking at you know labor or seniors groups or others who represent constituencies having AI expertise so they can show up in these policy debates, uh, as well as to, to invest more in, in government. Um, yeah, it, it's a real gap. Excellent. So thanks so much for your time and your, your deep thought about this uh, topic, Mark. We're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, I am seeing a few more questions coming in. Uh, we are going to capture these for the Canadian IGF report out to the global IGF community. Um, so these questions aren't just going in the trash. I wanted to let you folks know that. Um, and with that, we will pass it back to Nancy.
Okay, well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Nancy, and everybody. And if you if you tag me on Twitter, I may try, I'll try to answer those questions. And uh, so there may be another channel there. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Mark. Many of us have been following the conversation surrounding the Digital Charter Implementation Act, and, and your talk really helped to synthesize some of its important implications that we do not want to lose sight of. And thanks to everyone for your great and what Mark calls juicy questions. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to take a 15 minute break now. I'm not sure what the weather is where you are, but I'm going to make a cup of tea to keep it warm. It's snowing here in Ottawa. That said, don't stray too far away from your screen. We have a word from one of our partner sponsors, Sibera. Please welcome Barton Satchwell, who, will further, who has further deep thoughts about ethical AI. Welcome, Barton. Nice to see you. Thanks, Nancy. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. And thanks to everyone for um, sharing, uh, sharing your break with me. Um, why don't we bring up the, the first slide? So uh, my name is Barton Satchwell. I'm the Vice President of Technology at Cybera. Um, I can't possibly hope to, uh, to beat anything that, that Mark Sermon has said, but I thought that maybe I might be able to reinforce some of his points and talk about the work that, that we're doing with artificial intelligence and what we've learned about the technology, both good and bad. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Um, we, along with our sister organizations across Canada, are the National Research and Education Network. Next. Uh, we're a high speed, high capacity network we connect all the research institutions all across Canada, next slide, and across the world. Now, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about the r &E network. Canary, our, our federal partner in all of this, is presenting later this afternoon, and I expect they will paint a pretty good picture of our work. Um, but if you happen to see this very exact same slide in their presentation, just think of it as evidence of our warm collaboration. Next slide. But I don't want to let go of the r &E network without highlighting the importance of it. It brings together people to work on problems that are so large that require such vast resources that no one can really solve them alone. It, the ability to bring huge computing resources to bear on mind-numbing volumes of data is essential to working on the cutting edge problems and the questions that we face today. Next slide. But we lead a double life. In addition to operating the RE network in Alberta, we also have a mandate to encourage the adoption of new digital technology. Next slide. Now, any new technology is full of sharp edges, dead ends, pitfalls, and uncertain values, both economic and ethical. We take a hands-on approach to things and we work with tolerant, willing partners to apply technology to real-world problems. And in doing so, we're able to smooth out some of those sharp edges for the benefit of those who follow. Uh, next slide. We help, we uh, do the work to help others get across that chasm of technology adoption. And then as the technology matures and becomes safer, more familiar, better adopted, we look around and we start to look for something new to work with. Next slide. And there's always something new. Next, please. Uh, we started with the Research and Education Network. And then over the years, we've steadily climbed the technology stack. And this is important in order to stay relevant in this world. Next. About 10 years ago, we started to work with infrastructure uh, as a service cloud computing, which at the time was new and terrifying. Nobody really knew what to do. Next slide. And then after that, 
we moved on to infrastructure automation, working up at large scales. And next slide. And then a few years ago, we recognized that data analytics and machine learning was this next new, scary, uncertain technology. So we started to work with that. Now, the best way to learn is to do. And so we struck a small team of uh, software developers and data scientists and began to uh, explore the space a little bit. Now, I want to point out that as we climb this technology stack, it's not that the underlying layers are no longer important. It's just that they become more common and easier to adopt. Each layer makes the underlying layers more useful, in fact. And that's what makes the internet an essential service. It's the thing that we have built our digital world on top of. Um, next slide, please. So when we started to get into machine learning, the first thing we encountered was this staggering array of different techniques, different algorithms. This is just a partial list from about four years ago. Um, can you imagine what it looks like today? Next slide. We like to work on our projects very quickly, often just, a, just a, a couple of weeks from beginning to end. We do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, it reduces the cost of being wrong. It makes it uh, safer and easier for, for people to just try it out for the first time, see what kind of results they get. Uh, it demonstrates that something useful and meaningful can actually be accomplished in a short period of time. You don't need a 10-month waterfall project in order to find something. Uh, it generates a lot of excitement um, and new ideas about how to use data, how to get value from it. And most importantly, it very quickly brought us to the next question, which was usually a better question than the original one. Next slide. We worked with a wide range of different partners, all with different questions, different motivations, different problems. We worked with federal, provincial, municipal governments. We worked with K-12 schools, social agencies, entrepreneurs. Next slide. Uh, we worked with uh, different questions. Uh, hit the next slide. What, uh, what road features predict accidents? Next. Is this student at risk? Next. Should, how should I expose my data? Next. What information does my data set even contain? Next one. And what if Samuel Pepys wrote pop songs? Not every question we asked were uh, as profound as others, but they were all interesting and they were all useful. Uh, next slide. So everything we do is open by default. Everything is available for others to take and build upon. Everything we learn, everything we build, we share. This openness and transparency has earned us a degree of trust over the years, and, and I'm very proud of that. It has served us very well. Next slide. Our data science team uh, creates records of their work as they explore the machine learning and neural networks. And that record is available to anyone. Uh, we maintain it as a, as a sort of living textbook. Uh, next slide. Uh, we built a tool to bring data science and computational thinking into the primary school classrooms. Now, Using data science in the math or science curricula, that's obvious. But the applications I liked most uh, were in the humanities. Um, a text analysis of Shakespeare to study gender roles, or which Marvel movie plot is most like King Lear? Or in the social studies classroom, can students gather their own data to confirm or refute a study that appeared in a newspaper or a magazine. Next slide. The ability to think critically about data is being as a citizen. Uh, next slide. 
uh, we built a, a tool to help researchers and interveners understand submissions to a complicated CRTC public consultation. Uh, there were a, a, a huge number of documents that needed to be understood. We used natural language processing and graph databases to show the relationships between the topics and between the, the participants to understand whose voices influence the process and how. Uh, next slide. I kind of want to bring this back around to Mark Sermon's presentation and his concern about governance and privacy. In all of the work that, that, that we do, we are also concerned with the impact that these powerful technologies have on society. In 2014, the theme of our annual summit was using technology responsibly. Um, on the right hand side, that's um, Jill Clayton, the Privacy Commissioner of Alberta, and on the left is Michael Geist, who, who surely needs no introduction. Next slide. Um, in 2018, we revisited a lot of those ideas with the focus on using technology ethically. Next slide. So these summits were inspired, at least partially, by what we were learning from working with artificial intelligence. We were seeing firsthand many of the problems that, that Mark described in his presentation. Problems with biased data sets, the reinforcement of inequalities. These things, they, they create a, a mirror of our society, but rather it's a, a distorted view from some certain specific perspective. Does anybody remember Tay? She was a, a chatterbot uh, built by Microsoft and trained by reading millions of tweets. I thought this was a great idea. What better way to teach an artificial intelligence about human interaction than that? Well, it turns out that Twitter is one of those distorted mirrors and it took just 17 hours for Tay to turn into a vile, full-on racist Nazi. It's obvious now, but we just didn't think of it at the time. Next slide, please. Every day, we recognize more and more things that we just didn't think of before. Every day, more and more things move from that unknown, unknown quadrant into the known, unknown. Now, this is a good thing. It's the march of science, but it does make you worry about what else is in that deep, dark fourth quadrant. And it should make us cautious about how we use new technologies that are as powerful as artificial intelligence. Next slide. Um, just, just earlier last week, some, there was a, a paper, some researchers realized a fatal flaw in the way that just about every neural network is trained. It turns out that small random differences that are inevitable during training don't affect the test results in the lab, but it can produce a huge variation in the behavior of the model in the real world. So what happens in the lab doesn't necessarily tell you what's gonna happen in, in when you deploy this thing at scale. Next slide. So the real problem is that this artificial intelligence, it just works so darn well. The urge to rush things into production is, is it, it's almost too strong to resist. And as long as those unknowns remain unknown, it's, it's easy to brush them aside and just not think about them. One of the biggest problems that we recognized as we were working with these machine learning systems is that they will always produce an answer. It might be a terrible answer. It might be low probability, but you're not always told that. It might be based on a very small set of data or, or data from a different domain, but you don't know that. It feels like a reliable result. Now, as software engineers, we always want system fa failures to be loud and obvious. We want to know, we, we know that the worst failures are the ones that go un But so much of our technology is engineered to be beautifully, elegantly invisible. 
We don't want to see our technology. We just want it to work without the need for us to think about it. So once deployed, we stop questioning whether a technology is safe or not, whether it's fair or not, whether it's healthy for society or not. Next slide. Now, I, I don't want to end on a negative note. I, I'm an optimist by nature. I'm a technophile. And I believe that these tools can help us build a better society for all. But there are a lot of sharp edges and we need to take care. All of the work that we do to help others gain the benefit from this digital technology would be impossible without computer networks that are fast, reliable, open, and neutral. And this is why the work that the IGF does here today is so important. Next slide. So this year we continue the conversation at, at our summit discussing the surveillance com, uh, economy with Cory Doctorow and robot ethics with Kate Darling. I'm looking forward to that. Our summit actually runs today and tomorrow. Um, I know it overlaps with this event. Um, so it might create a difficult choice for you, but fortunately there's no bad choice. Whichever event you choose to attend, it's gonna be rewarding. We believe in the work that the IGF is doing we know that it is important, so much so that uh, I'm missing our own event right now so that I could speak here today. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, yeah, I'm out of time right now. So thanks very much for your, for your attention. I'm very pleased to have been here. Uh, let me turn it back to... Uh, to your host. Martin, thanks so much. And um, just so you know, as soon as we're done here, the end of the day, I'll be tuning into the Cyber Summit and I'm there for the pub event for sure. Uh, as a CFO, Barton, I really like that you think about reducing the cost of being wrong. That's fantastic. So welcome back, everyone. Nice to see you back. Nice. Next slide, please. Nowadays, governments depend on non-government partners to implement large-scale projects, such as contact tracing in response to COVID-19, to use one very top-of-mind example. Current models of data and AI governance, however, tend to concentrate access in the hands of a few large technology companies and exclude citizens from sharing their value. How can new governance tools, such as data trusts, provide individuals with more control over their personal data and enhance individual privacy and human rights. To explore this question and other good ones related to data governance, I welcome Skydra Pajunas, the moderator for our next panel. Skydra is a senior engagement advisor at the Ontario Digital Service, where she highlights the voices of multidisciplinary teams working to make government services intuitive for all and she manages Ontario Digital, a blog on digital, the Ontario government, and all things in between. Skydra, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Thanks so much, Nancy. Really excited to be here. And thank you to everyone online joining us. Um, we want to try and make this as interactive as possible. So if you do have questions, I just encourage you to drop them in the chat. We want to integrate them as, as best as we can throughout this session. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to Barton. I really, really liked that frame of, you know, we just want tech to work and we don't always think about like what's going on in the background. So I think this, this panel is really going to bring to light the thinking, the thinking behind the partnerships, particularly the government private sector partnerships that, that need to happen to really make large scale projects for public purpose work. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to introduce you all to our panelists. So um, I wanted to start off by saying hello, Philip, if you can give a wave. <laughs> uh, so Philip joins us as a public policy lead at Element AI, a leading AI solutions company headquartered in Montreal. He also leads the company's policy work on the governments of data and AI, and he's a frequent speaker at international workshops, um, including being a co-chair of the Data Governance Standardization 
collaboration in Canada, to name a few. So thank you, Philip. Then we have Ashley. Oh, Ashley, if you can give a wave. <laughs> So Ashley Kesevin has been at the forefront of building tools and, you know, and mindful policy inter interventions to support the responsible use and adoption of innovative technologies. I'm interested in particular, as she is um, on leave from the government of Canada as a public servant, I'm a public servant myself, and is now an executive director at AI Global, a multi-stakeholder nonprofit dedicated to mitigating harm and unintended consequences of AI systems, and really has made um, has has been a, a prominent figure in the social tech community, chairing and being involved in many forums like chairing the Responsible AI Certification Working Group at the World Economic Forum. So hello, Ashley. And finally, we have Stephen. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Stephen is a chairman and managing general partner at Reeds Capital. If you can give away, Stephen, there you are. I can see on my screen now. Um, and in addition, Stephen is tremendously unique. He holds, he has, wears many different hats, like chairman, founder, um, board, roles in business and startups, in successful entrepreneurship, investment, venture capital ecosystems. He's a futurist. He's won lifetime and career achievement awards for the contributions he's made and he is truly dynamic and we're just so grateful to have Stephen joining us so thank you Stephen. So I do in the spirit of time want to get right into it and give each of you no more than three minutes to answer our first question which is what actions are you taking to advance data governance approaches in the public interest and I'd love to start with Ashley so thanks. All right. I just had to get off of mute. Um, the approaches that we're taking are really trying to think about what is it that government needs in the digital era. And so part of the work that I've been involved with over the course of uh, my career, both in municipal government and then now in federal government and on leave of absence from federal government, is thinking about how we can use various different mechanisms like policies and these working groups that you're mentioning that I've um, been leading and participating to really enable the change that we desire and want to see. And I know that sounds a little bit cheesy, but it is really important in thinking about um, how do we have this collective action and what is it that each individual can do and take ownership of? And I think that if we think about policies, we usually think about compliance mechanisms, and that's really not the intention around it. Often we're trying to use, at least how I thought about using policies, is um, as a mechanism to help to inform various different actions and what needs to be done and thought about when um, implementing various different tools, uh, especially in the digital era. And so uh, part of that enablement is also just collaboration and working with various different experts. And so um, that's why the work that I am continuing to do is really building off of what I've done in government in having these uh, multi-stakeholder forums to address some of the most significant challenges as it relates to the use of data, the use of AI, um, and how that could be helpful or harmful for, uh, for the public and the planet, and how can we then um, address the issues where there are those harms. So that's, I'm sure we'll talk more about all of that. Fantastic, uh, Phil? Okay, okay. Now, now I'm unmuted. Uh, um, the, thanks very much, uh, Skydra. Um, so at Elements, uh, we, I, th I think we're taking a few different approaches to advancing uh, public interest data governance. Um, the first, I'd say, is is coalition building and, and building partnerships uh, uh, that are interested in creating communities of practice. So one of the first things we did at Element as we got interested in this uh, this topic and and data and specifically data trust as a vehicle to embed public uh, participation uh, and uh, in decisions about the use of data was uh, was host a workshop on data trust we ordered we and we or we invited um, experts um, on data governance and stakeholders from uh, from across uh, a spectrum of uh, government uh, representatives international organizations uh, academics uh, uh, data scientists and and then put out a report on 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 data trust as kind of our first uh, uh, initiative to raise the profile of this discussion and get more 
uh, people involved in in uh, in pushing for new models of data governance. Um, and you know, and I mentioned partnerships. So we've we've uh, we found in Mozilla uh, a good part, a great partnership uh, that we've. Uh, uh, and for over the last 18 months or so, we've been um, have various conversations with them about how they can also play a key role in in, in building these communities of practice, and that they're going ahead with uh, this data governance uh, lab, which is very exciting. We also participate in standards work, um, so uh, at more of a technical and granular level, the development of uh, industry standards. My colleague Grace Abu Hamid, is, is, uh, who is involved in the organization of this event, is involved in, in a few of the different um, ISO committees at, at the national and international level. And uh, and yeah, and I and I participate on something called the Data Governance Standardization Collaborative, which is an initiative under the Digital Charter to uh, to create a roadmap of priority areas of data governance that the the government and, and other stakeholders should collectively pursue and expedite to ensure that um, uh, that SMEs uh, have have good clarity on what type of standards they should be using and what types of governance and ethical issues should be considered uh, in in, uh, in in the use of data by 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 any type of organization. So uh, th those are a few things that we're doing uh, at Element and and that I'm involved in personally um, uh, that hopefully are, have advanced in some ways uh, public interest approaches to data governance. I just want to quickly ask you, just because you know we're having a, a panel on digital literacy following this, how would you sort of like simplify what a data trust is, given maybe not everyone is coming to this sort of discussion really understanding what that is. Sure. So a data trust, in a, uh, a a data trust, very simply, is uh, the use of a legal vehicle uh, which um, endows the a board of governors uh, with specific duties to uh, the holders of data rights. Now, as a lot of I know that some colleagues of mine watching will will be rolling their eyes because maybe that wasn't so simple, but. Uh, imagine if imagine if you were on a social media platform and instead of your data that is being collected or generated through your usage of the platform, imagine that data was not only going to whatever uh, social media platform uh, you're browsing, but going instead to a, uh, a different independent entity that managed the use, uh, the collection and use of that data on your behalf for your, uh, in your with your best interest at heart. Not a commercial and uh, best interest, uh, commercial um, uh, interest of the company or the platform that you're browsing on, but uh, another uh, another independent entity that was uh, essentially set up to manage your data in your best interest. That's what it, that's very short way of explaining what a data trust is, or an example of one. That's fantastic, and I'd like for all of us to kind of come back to that that question in our own ways. That's great. Okay, Stephen, over to you. Sure, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Now, keep in mind, I, I work with about 60,000 CEOs and uh, or leaders within the UN agencies and so on. So, so my perspective is more from a strategic standpoint. So I, I want to reframe your question to sort of the responsible data governance and, and the impact that's going to have together with AI. And so we feel, uh, view this as sort of an inflection point and new services and products but also new business models, government systems, uh, governance, as well organizational models, uh, operational models, economic models, political, social, and cultural changes. And as I mentioned, uh, really a profound uh, change uh, within the next few years. And then throughout all of this, we consider then a whole bucket of items like accountability, responsibility, transparency, uh, fairness and equity and inclusion, ethics and explainability, interpretability, trustworthiness, and reliability, bias and impartiality, data portability, liability, vicarious liability, privacy, confidentiality, contestability, and human control. So there's a lot of big buckets that we look at. And then what am I involved with? Well, um, I was one of the founders of AI for Good. In fact, I proposed it back in 2015 in New York and then went to ITU and we created the first summit uh, called the AI for Good Summit. The thing is uh, that the summit is all about uh, governance, data governance and AI as well. And we even have standards work and I can get into more detail on that like AI for Health, 
machine learning and 5G and so on. Um, there's other UN agencies that I work with, uh, more on the sort of the safety aspect, of, like UNIFRI, for example, which is the United Nations Crime and Research uh, Institute. Um, from a business standpoint, there's the partnership on AI, uh, Microsoft, has something called Microsoft Business School, which has information on and, and programs on governance of data and AI and so on. And then from a usable resource standpoint, I'm actually working with different academic communities. For example, I'm the past chair of KIPS and we have the Code of Ethics, which can help in providing guidance on, and governance over a, uh, data and AI or ACM, which just came out with the Code of Ethics or IFIP, but we came up with Global Code of Ethics, very much can be applied to governance of data and AI. And I can point to some very specifics in that area. So. Those are some of the buckets that I'm involved with. That's great. Thanks everyone for sort of laying the laying some of the work that, that you're doing and how your organizations are, are, are stepping up. And so I kind of want to bring it to a tangible level. So I would like to sort of ask all of you if there are any case examples top of mind where these standards in place or these government private partnerships are modeling the type of balanced new tech legal regulatory ethical frameworks that you'd like to see more of and I thought maybe we could start with Phil and you could sort of um, bring an example that comes top of mind for you. If possible, <laughs> if you could hear me. <laughs> I think you're still on. Do you want me? Could you hear me? Could you hear my question? <laughs> yeah, I, I hear. I hear your question. So, um, I wasn't sure if it was the question was being addressed to me first, but um, yeah, yeah. So I have. I think I have a couple of good examples. I think uh, some top of mind examples where government private partnerships are modeling uh, that type of balanced uh, approach. Um, the first one that comes to mind is the collaboration between uh, the Canadian government. Um, and different ministries, as well as the Canadian Digital Service, and uh, and stakeholders from the private sector um, on the the, uh, the the development of the COVID Alert app. And uh, let me uh, expand a little bit. Um, the I know we know that there have been some people and some who have been concerned that the government has been. Uh, has, has taken a solution or uh, um, developed by companies like Google and Apple, uh, which has limited in some ways their ability to use the app uh, uh, more freely, um, depending on the, the, the future needs in this pandemic. Uh, but that being said, what the government did do then is largely develop this app uh, in-house through the Canadian Digital Service um, in close collaboration with an external advisory council comprised of technologists, public health experts, uh, data governance experts, lawyers, uh, um, and, and, and very transparently develop um, the app and, and, and reporting structures uh, to, to help measure and monitor its effectiveness and also um, the, the length of its utility. So I think you know that has been um, at least from the genesis of the app onwards and the governance structures that have been built up around this um, public-private partnership and the development of this app. I think that has been very um, uh, a very good example that uh, that future governments, uh, future initiatives between federal or provincial municipal governments could look to. Um, uh, if I have time, I'll share one more uh, top of mind example. Um, and uh, which is simply that last in the last year, uh, our some members of our team at Element AI were part of a uh, human rights impact assessment that Waterfront Toronto um, commissioned uh, to as a as a further kind of governance uh, mechanism or a, um, uh, a review process to ensure that the digital proposals made by Sidewalk Labs for the Smart City Project in Toronto. Uh, were were well at least the risks were well understood and that some some um, some policy and governance uh, proposals were made to mitigate that. So I think you know that itself was uh, in my in my to my knowledge quite unprecedented uh, move for a public or at least quasi public uh, entity to to make that type of um, commission that type of assessment uh, in a very forward looking way. 
um, even as you know the project wasn't wasn't underway yet. So it was. I know that you know Ashley is familiar with this type of uh, assessment uh, too. It's kind of part of the uh, the, the rationale of the the directive and automated decision making systems that the that the government um, uh, developed a couple of years ago for uh, public procurement. So I mean that was that that was an, that's another example I think where public private partnerships were looking to new tools to help understand the risks of digital technologies. Thanks. That's fantastic. Ashley, do you want to chime in? Sure, provide your own example? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. And it's great to have this balance of Stephen and Phil thinking about things from the lens of both the private sector and then international organizations in combination with that, that investment perspective. And then also um, the work that Phil does to co-chair the Data Governance Steering Committee, which I also have the um, pleasure of participating in. And I think that these are types of things where we've seen some instances, but definitely not enough of government and industry working hand in hand um, in a less adversarial way than we see through typical procurement processes where there is an evaluation and um, not to suggest that their procurement isn't a good approach. I'll come back to that in a second, but just to say that um, typically without an, an official procurement in place, there's not an ability to have the same type of uh, open dialogue to work together to address challenges. And that's something that I think um, we're seeing with not only the Data Governance Steering Committee, but some of the work that we did on having an open source advisory board um, just to inform internal government policy, as well as um, some of the other work that we see with Canada's AI Advisory Council, for example. So there's quite a few of these different initiatives that are popping up. Um, and I think just the ability to have that different perspective allows for ultimately better products and whether that be policy. So um, what Phil was mentioning is the work that we've done on in the government of Canada on the directive on, on automated decision-making systems. And the, the goal of that work um, was really to think about government's use of AI systems and ensuring that there was a protection of the public while balancing innovation and the use of these tools to try and augment or automate uh, processes uh, where possible within the government context. So both balancing that like helpful and harmful side and what do we do with that? And I know we'll get more into kind of <laughs> what we can do to protect uh, people in a minute, but I think that just thinking about that a little bit, Phil also mentioned that um, that had a connection back to our procurement. So in addition to the directive on automated decision-making systems, we also um, were in parallel working on a uh, pre-qualified vendor list or a supply list. And um, part of that was thinking that procurement is a big mechanism in which there are these various different tools being integrated into uh, their use within the government. And so making sure that policies don't just like stand alone, that that essence is built into other mechanisms. And so having procurement as be one of those gates was really important for us. And so within that uh, mechanism, we look to assess um, AI vendors against competency, capacity, and ethics, um, which aligned with the intent of the Directive on Automated Decision-Making Systems. Whether or not that was a perfect process uh, is neither here nor there, probably because um, there was lots of, um, there's still lots to learn about how AI companies are working, um, but the intent was really to connect it and align it with that direction that we were going. Um, and I would say additionally to the directive was also the um, G7 work, which is now evolved into the Global Partnership on AI, but at the time was the Canada France. Canada France task uh, AI task force working group. Oh, I cannot speak today. I'm so sorry. Um, but also just a million acronyms. And now that I'm out of government, I don't use them all the time anymore. So um, I'll blame it on that. But um, I think that these are different um, types of initiatives. Again, where that um, public and industry uh, perspective are coming together that I think is very valuable. And I'm saying this from the perspective of just businesses, but I should be very clear that I also would include academia and civil society in that. I don't wanna forget that. That's fantastic. Steven, do you have anything to bring into this comment?
There, I'm trying to mute here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I work across so many uh, different organizations, in fact, over 100, and, but from a more of a strategic level and, and from a practicality standpoint as well. So we've been monitoring, for example, uh, UNESCO, where you know they've uh, surfaced, I guess now about 150 uh, frameworks around governance and data and accountability. And they created an expert group and they should have adoption of their program uh, at their 41st uh, general conference, uh, November next year. Uh, we think that's a uh, very important work. But keep in mind the conversation has matured significantly beyond a list of sort of ethical or governance sort of principles to the operationalization of these principles. And we're really tracking those uh, very carefully. And we saw this movement particularly in 2019. Uh, for example, Australia came out with a program. Canada has been a long leader in this program. Uh, the European Union, OECD, Singapore are other examples. Uh, from an academic community standpoint, the uh, IEEE uh, came out with a process model that's very usable. So keep in mind, I come from industry. So it's good to have these ideas, but what, what are sort of the practical ways that we can use it? So they have their piece uh, 7,000 process model. And then in fact, uh, Ashley's connected with a lot of these, but there's also the ISO IEC J, uh, JTC 1 SC 42, artificial intelligence standard. And I also mentioned the, the UN, I'm a founder of AI for Good, and, and it's a very solution focused practicality program about governance data and the application of AI. And I'll give you one example. Uh, for AI for health, we're actually studying, uh, setting performance standards in the application of AI and data uh, worldwide. We have the FDAs around the world involved, corporations, uh, definitely academic groups and governments are supporting that program. Um, but we also have also other programs like machine learning and 5G, AI and data for environmental efficiency, AI and data for autonomous assisted uh, driving. Uh, we have one in AI and data commons. In fact, uh, sort of a shout out to Phil and Element uh, AI. They're in fact uh, uh, one of the founders of that program. And then we created some called the uh, UN Conven uh, Compendium, sort of tracking all of the activity uh, that are out there. But I also I should, as I mentioned, point out Unicree. Unicree, this uh, UN Crime and Re uh, uh, Crime Institute has a number of programs around this area, particularly around safety. Uh, there's a program from the Institute for Accountability in the Digital Age. Uh, so I'm trying to point out programs that you should have a look at. There's the KVNI uh, from, has a smart humanity program. Uh, I earlier mentioned Microsoft uh, from a practicality standpoint has their business school with responsible governance uh, to Toronto Dominion Bank has come out with the responsible AI and governance and on financial services. Uh, Microsoft has a part of its Harvard University on differential uh, privacy. And then Canada itself has their AI uh, health task force. And there's notable programs at uh, the Alberta Machine Intelligence uh, Institute, uh, Vector Institute in Toronto, Mila, of course, which is corrected, uh, connected to Element AI in Montreal and Yashua Benjo. And again, Phil and Element in AI and, and uh, AI Global with Ashley. And just now, there's the Global Roundtable on AI and Digital National Competitive uh, uh, Resilience and so on. That's just about to happen. And of course, this is a, in consultation with BCG and UNESCO. But it's really the first time globally that a dialogue has come together on national initiatives around governance and so on. So I just wanted to point some of these out. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. And it's nice to to, to hear you know, Canada being recognized on, on a global scale. We don't often pat ourselves on the back for the work that we do. So thank you, Stephen, for shedding light on that. And I wanna actually weave in a question we got from the audience, um, reframing it slightly. So obviously COVID alert is top of mind and, and you know, Phil touched on it a little bit and an example of perhaps in the art of the possible of, of talking about working public private partnership models. Um, and the question is asking, you know, it's a great example of what open source collaboration can enable. And we see a lot of adoption of open data among governments in Canada, but what more is possible? So maybe Ashley, you can kind of kick us off in that discussion. 
Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks. And these are great questions. I love hearing how people are interested in getting more involved in government. Um, that was really the re reason why I got involved in government in the first place is because I thought that there was coming from Alberta, a lack of involvement and but complaints about what it does. So this is, is great to hear. At the same time, um, I think that open government is a fairly unique initiative in the sense that it is providing a lot of different uh, information that the government has, and then it's asking citizens to contribute and collaborate. And we're seeing more um, collaboration opportunities related to various different consultations, for example. But this two-way dialogue um, with government and citizens, especially at a federal level, um, is not, I wouldn't say it's a super, super open door. Um, I do really, I'm super inspired by what we see in municipal government quite often um, in that there's a lot more hackathons and those types of activities where it's not it's just limited to work that's being done in open data, um, but kind of coming up with different types of concepts. Um, so they could be hackathons for policy, et cetera. And so I'd really like to see that more. One of the things that we did um, with the directive is, that I mentioned earlier, the directive on automated decision-making systems, is it was the first um, directive that was completely done in the open. And so we put it into a Google Doc and we had uh, people participate and provide feedback on it. And so this idea of open policy making, I think is something that I would really like to see a lot more. And back to the points that I was making earlier on that type of collaboration and different perspectives can only lead to better outcomes. Um, and so again, whether that's um, with the objectives like open data has that the data can be improved, the uses of it could be different than what the government's use of it was. Um, so it could even build new businesses or it could just give insights in ways that the government necessarily hadn't thought of it being used. Um, it really expands those opportunities. And I think we can apply that exact same logic to open policy making. Um, the other thing that I would say is that more um, and back to back to AI specifically is that a lot of models um, and AI systems are actually open source tools and technologies. And so again, um, potentially using those um, to be able to find ways that can help um, various different initiatives. I was going to say municipal initiatives because that seems like the most obvious, um, but different initiatives that could help um, different services could be something that we would like to see. One example that I always really liked, um, and again, this is more from an open data perspective because that's the information that we have now, uh, is the idea of air quality monitoring. And so to be able to crowdsource uh, air quality uh, assessments or capturing of it, um, but then to be able to put uh, the protocols online for what's an acceptable air quality monitor and then either that to be purchased or to be made, um, would be something that I could see uh, in the future being really, really interesting and that idea of participatory government. And I guess the last thing that I would say is um, there's a lot of, speaking of participatory government, participatory budgeting um, is something that has happened a lot at the municipal level. And I'd really love to see that institutionalized at all levels of government. And again, that really opens up that, that dialogue and communication with, uh, with people. That said, there is still a little bit of a barrier to entry in terms of um, digital knowledge and digital participation. And actually, um, this came up on a panel that I was on yesterday. Um, so I would attribute it to Anna Brandescu, but she was talking about um, the challenges associated with, like you have to have a lot of time. You, it's a privilege in order to be able to take the time to participate. And you also have to have that knowledge. And I think that that's not something that everybody has. So also as institutions, and this is one huge lesson learned for me from an open government perspective, is we can't just put it out there and expect that everybody's going to be able to use it. So I just think that um, that's a really important piece. And also it has to be good enough quality and understandable. And I think Phil will talk more about data um, as we move forward with this, but that's a big, big piece of this is that if you're putting out garbage, it can't really be that consumable or easily consumable. Uh, 
Absolutely. No, there, and you know, this ties in really nicely with this, this, another audience question we sort of got, you know, building into this idea of like, is the public sufficiently informed, you know, to contribute to the development of data governance in the public interest? And, you know, if not, like, what are some of the, the barriers or how can this best be approached on, on national levels, municipal levels, or, or global levels? And um, Phil or Stephen, either of you want to respond to that to kick us off? I mean, I can respond from a global standpoint. All of the UN programs are open. <laughs> They're open platforms. Uh, for example, the focus group AI for Health, we have Canadian participation, but it could be governments, uh, individuals, uh, research groups, corporations, it, it, all of them are. And ITU is uh, 155 years old. It's, uh, a, in fact, it predates the United Nations. And they have standards programs across all of the buckets we talked about, whether it's open government and open data, uh, common data formats, uh, all of the uh, six uh, um, focus groups that I mentioned earlier, like environment and climate and health, uh, focus group AI on health and autonomous vehicles and data commons, having the data common format, all of them are open. So really it's just a matter, I think, educating the public like I'm doing here, um, the majority are actually open open platforms. Anybody can participate. Bill? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to just add a little bit to what Stephen's saying. Uh, you know, also at Element, we also participate in a number of these uh, UN organizations um, that are looking at different standards and, and policies for AI and data governance. But, you know, most of the ones that I'm involved in, they have very limited um, uh, opportunity for public to to participate in them. There's usually even for civil society. There's a, usually a, a you know a couple. There's a, there's a designated uh, you know seat for civil society or different civil society organizations. But uh, that's I think quite different than members of the public, um, uh, who as Ashley mentioned, are not o don't always have that kind of uh, time to invest in in just better understanding. Uh, risks related to the use of, of, of data that they're participating in generating. So, I mean, I think there are other ways that uh, that we, that in Canada, different uh, governments or uh, who are looking at uh, data, um, uh, implementing um, digital technologies can, can help foster debate prior to, uh, debate and understanding prior to the, the launch of projects. I know it was, uh, again, a, a controversial um, a process and didn't always go um, uh, smoothly, but there was a, a huge amount of, of discussion and consultation that was generated as a result of that uh, Sidewalk Labs proposal in Toronto. And uh, I got to uh, participate in a few of the public consultations and even conduct um, interviews with stakeholders. And I would say when we met people who were super knowledgeable about the project or people who had, were just tuning in for the first time, like last spring, which was quite you know deep into the project. People often had enough knowledge to express, uh, even if they didn't know anything about the proposals. You know, they were asking the right basic questions, like how am I going to know if data is being collected? How am I going to know how it's going to be used? Where how will I know if there's a data collecting device in the public space? So I mean, those you don't need to be kind of a data scientist or specialist to, or, uh, in data governance to ask these fundamental questions like wh who's collecting data, what's it being used for, how do I know? Um, and uh, so, I mean, at the very basic level, there, there, there's, there's, you know, that is almost good enough literacy for, to, to ask, to, to hold um, different uh, either public or private sector organizations to account. Um, and you know some of that we've seen has has been incorporated into the the the, um, the digital charter implementation act the, the the recently announced bill to reform our and replace existing pri federal privacy legislation in Canada so we you know the, there's a promise of data mobility rights of being able to uh, move your data from one organization to another uh, being able to withdraw consent to have data deleted to ask uh, you know uh, interrogate organizations about data practices or storage uh, and what data they're holding so there's you know there there is some of that is already making its way into proposed legislation and then i think there's other initiatives that we can do a better job of making into uh you know either provincial or national or larger conversations one is coming up around 
I just want to highlight around this data governance standards roadmap that uh, Standards Council of Canada is developing um, with uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration. There's going to be, a, a, I think, a, a large uh, public outreach and consultation effort around the, this this document that's going to that's going to outline kind of um, uh, what data governance and, and standards are from you know the point of collection through the to the point of processing and use and governance con considerations that come up throughout the kind of data governance or uh, value chain. So I, you know, there is a planned consultation around this, and we have to find other organizations who are interested in helping promote this and socialize it and and make it uh, digestible to people who who won't be able to attend, you know, I guess virtually, uh, or to share in in some of those discussions. So we have to like look look at either projects that are about to be launched. You can think of Toronto as an example. I I would argue a huge, what regardless of what you thought about that project. The, I think digital literacy went up in Toronto uh, as a result of uh, of that uh, those kind of intense almost two years or more of, of discussions and probably nationally because of it. Um, and so before projects uh, we could do that, before big policy initiatives, uh, the government can help do that. I think they did in part through the consultations on the new federal privacy legislation at the end 2018. There's another opportunity now that the bill is out and then um, through other initiatives like this data governance standards um, roadmap that's coming out, this is something that that should be uh, kind of a, uh, a touchstone for these conversations and in increasing digital literacy. Um, but you know, and then there are other questions about uh, you know, who has time to participate, uh, you know, and and for whom is it going to be costly for, to participate because they're taking time away from. Um, from uh, from employment or or uh, or family care, uh, and, and you know those are those are important questions. And and you know those who are launching these consultations and planning them really need to plan resources to ensure that there is that type of access uh, to the conversation. And I I think that like really ties in really well with sort of this this other this other point I like us to kind of um, get into a little bit. And you know it's it's why why does it matter? Like why does really thinking through the access and the um, the implications of these decisions that are being made on the data governance tables, like why does it really matter? And it really makes me think of um, this quote that I attribute to a colleague of mine at the Ontario Digital Service, Lauren Nelson Hamilton, who was sort of saying, you know, today is a great day to stop saying vulnerable persons and start saying persons made vulnerable through policy decisions. And this extends to design decisions, this extends to consultation decisions. And so I'd love for each of you to, to chime in on that and sort of share how this applies to the context of our discussion. I'm Maybe I can start. jump in with a question. Go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Ash. So I, I think that um, I had never really thought about the phrase vulnerable persons um, until we started doing the AI work and really understanding the impact that these systems could have and often unintentionally. And one of the things when you dig into the myriad of problems associated or potential problems associated with these systems is you realize it's just doubling down on the issues that we already have in society and doubling or tripling or quadrupling down. Like it's expediting these, these existing um, constructual problems in how we have structured our systems and our society. And that's important because if a lot of the evidence that we're basing current decision making off of is flawed, um, then that's just bleeding into an automation and further perpetuation of those issues. And I find that, um, yes, it's important to bring awareness to phrases like vulnerable populations or vulnerable persons and use um, and create a, that awareness around persons made vulnerable through policy decisions. Um, but even then, it's it's difficult to um, to kind of get people to shift on that. And I think what is really important from this is that we are thinking about whatever the label is, we are thinking about including that and incorporating that into our evaluation and use of these systems. Um, or even thinking about it in terms of the impact that that data might have um, with however we're using it. So whether we're using it manually to make policy um, choices or we're using it to inform ourselves 
or we are um, using it in these automated systems, I think it's really important that we recognize um, that some of this historical data has these types of biases or lack of fairness, or maybe the uh, data that you're looking at is good for one setting, but not necessarily for another setting. And these are the types of things that I think we need to keep in mind. Again, um, independent of what that label is. And yes, often it does come from these historical issues. Um, but recognizing that now we have a time to um, have an intervention and improve that. Well put. Phil? Sure, I'll just add uh, a little bit to what Ashley was saying. First, I, I, I like the I like the uh, the question. I think there's um, something I learned in the last couple of years is in the uh, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. They typically don't refer to vulnerable vulnerable persons, but persons at a greater risk of vulnerability, which which uh, I like very much, and I think it's true. Um, uh, when policy decisions or decisions about da uh, uh, tech projects are being made, um, you can you can make you can increase people's risk of vulnerability. And I think one of the ways is um, is is if we if we stick to um, in certainly in public private uh, partnerships and public sector projects, if we were to stick to um, an enterprise data management. Um, formula for the use of data. So a company or the, the, the partnership uh, has sole kind of custody of data that it collects and uses and oversight over, um, over the use of that data. Um, and, and, and nobody else and certainly and the people who, people who are impacted by the project. So in, in this case, people in either smart cities or uh, people who are, or are, are trying to navigate a kind of the new world of, uh, of this pandemic context, possibly using the COVID alert app, um, you know, it, there was no access to the the kind of governance structure that underpins the collection and use of that data for these people. Then everybody's at a risk of vulnerability because uh, power is concentrated again in in one or a couple entities. Um, power over collection, over use, analysis. Uh, Without any type of um, uh, scrutiny from from the public, or at least transparency, and I, I don't think we see that with the COVID Alert app, as I mentioned already. And I think this is an example of moving beyond uh, a mindset where, as an enterprise or as two enterprises in partnership, we are collecting using this data. We are we are adapting our governance to uh, take into account the fact that there are people who might be made vulnerable um, uh, through the use of, of this data, the development of this technology. And it, some of the early responses to the COVID Alert app were about uh, some of the design choices and ac accessibility and the availability of you know, certain smartphones to different groups, di different demogra demographics and not others. Um, and and you know, there was a way to bring this type of feedback, uh, I think, back to the to the uh, to the to the Canadian Digital Service, not only uh, you know through through the advisory council and and also directly um, as, as you can do with the government, but in other other uh, uh, projects that might not have been um, you might you might have needed this external body. So I think um, yeah, I think we have to reimagine the way that we envision uh, the you know power over the governance of, the, of data and incorporate. Um, uh, new structures that enable public access and scrutiny. Thanks. And Stephen? Well, I reminded uh, yesterday the Pope came out with a statement, right, in his prayers about uh, this whole aspect of humankind and, and you have to have inclusion and caring and it's got to be for good uh, because if you don't, then, you know, there could be all sorts of issues. And in fact, the Vatican with Microsoft and IBM earlier this year came up with some principles. Uh, six principles around you know, the use of data and, and AI and so on. So, and so this aspect, uh, you know, what are the implications if the policy isn't right? And what are the implications in terms of the vulnerabilities? You know, I reminded, um, you know, this year, uh, the Australian or the Austrian courts came down with a case uh, where somebody posted a photo of the chair of the Austrian uh, Green Party and made some comments and it was, it was deemed uh, defamation under Austrian law, and, and there's a requirement now 
uh, to take it down uh, worldwide. So, uh, you know, how do you manage that kind of process? Or there's the uh, UK case, uh, the Kin Can cost the case about AI and investment strategies, you know, who's accountable for the losses of the use of data and, and algorithms or in Australia, there's this uh, Centrelink RoboDebt welfare recipients were negatively impacted and uh, to the detriment of other sort of welfare. Um, you know, so, you know, these broader questions of managing all of this and, you know, how, how, how can we use models like Singapore, for example, is just last year uh, released a national strategy with that we think is interesting. Um, and sort of this ramifications overall. Um, even though uh, China is sort of a position in a particular way, there's some interesting things in the, in the policies that they're putting out um, that I think still require to have a look at. So, and then when you, when you cover all of these, you know, there's this whole question of when you're divining uh, principles and policies, who ethical principles are they? Uh, who, whose uh, regulatory and legal sort of moral codes are they based on? Because they, they do differ depending on the person, the social cultural background, um, you know, the geography, the religion and so on. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult question. And, and uh, you know, how do we implement these models? And just take a look at what's happening in North America. And, and, <laughs> And uh, from a from a dis, uh, destabilization standpoint or a, a unity standpoint, in fact, I just finished convening and in fact helped found a summit called the YPO Impact Summit. YPO is a group of 27,000 or 29,000 CEOs represent, represented by 9 trillion in annual revenue, being around for 90 or 70 years. And we held our first impact summit of addressing some of the big issues, technology being the underpinning and how can we make things happen from a solution and effective standpoint to move the needle in a positive way. So, so a lot, lot of stuff going on, but it's so nuanced and it's very difficult. It's all in the nuance, but no, that's, that's, I could listen to you all speak for, for much longer. This has been fascinating. And we only have a few minutes left, but we did have a question in the audience about where can folks learn more about the, the data governance roadmap. So if you just head to Canada.ca and type in the Privy Council, publications and developments on the data strategy are listed there. If you're referring to something else, um, ask us and we'll get back to you <laughs> among all the organizers. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you an answer. Um, okay, so we only have three minutes and I want each of you to have one minute. I, I do wanna end on a kind of a high note and sort of an opportunity to perhaps elevate the voice of someone else who's inspiring you in the data, in the data governance AI space. So each of you one minute to provide a final thought and point to one Canadian that is personally inspiring you uh, in the work that you do. So, um, Let's 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 go to Phil first. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Just unmute myself. Um, yeah, one person. That's uh, there's a there are a, a lot of people, and usually the 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 kind of efforts that I'm following are being managed by teams of people. Um, so I hope I can break the rule here a little bit and mention like maybe two teams. Um, and the first I'd mentioned is I, I'd just say it again, but is this uh, the data governance standardization collaborative that both Ashley and I are part of? It, you know, it would not uh, be possible without uh, the dedicated uh, work of Standards Council of Canada um, and their CEO Chantal Gay, but also especially uh, Annika Olvera, who uh, are, are leading, who is leading this work and and working extremely hard to make sure this this roadmap is available in early 2021 um, and so the roadmap if you're looking for it isn't isn't out there just yet but it, it should be in the next few months and more information about the consultation will be coming soon so you know that is a team at standards council of canada that is doing um very um uh that is doing concrete work uh, uh and moving it along much more quickly than 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 is typically possible given the the importance of the subject um, and then I'd also say, you know, the, the team of uh, team of uh, people that includes political staff, civil servants, and people who participated in the uh, the consultations for federal privacy legislation. And I just encourage everybody to uh, to read the announcement uh, last week that summarizes some of the key features of the in the Digital Charter Implementation Act. So those two initiatives and teams are what I want to highlight. Thank you. 
Steven? You know, this is easy. I mean, I actually have Ashley in my keynotes because Canada was the first out with a widely recognized national strategy first, and Ashley is behind that, right? So, and just look what she's doing, chair of the certification group for World Economic Forum. She has her uh, global uh, AI initiative or AI global with her certification mark. I mean, uh, she's on the data governance collaboration community. She's working with the US Government Accountability Office. I mean, she's working with the IEEE. Uh, she's working with the ISO standard that I mentioned earlier. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. I mean, we've got a resident hero here on the panel. <laughs> so, and, and in fact, Order of Canada, I think she should be a, 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 you know, a potential recipient for Order of Canada. And I also want to point out Philip at Element AI. Element AI and Mila, because it's really a spin off of Mila, a really world renowned institute, has been doing just tremendous leadership work. Um, from, you know, uh, and all of which is, it, it has so many different sort of social impact, you know, um, doing good for the world that they definitely need some kind of kudos. And of course, there's Joshua Benjo, uh, Benjo who's, uh, you know, the founder, but uh, Philip going out as, as the advocate globally. I get, again, these two, uh, you know, I really want to put the spotlight on them and the tremendous work they're doing. Thanks, Stephen. And, and Ashley, 20 seconds. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Thank you. Also, um, the other thing I would just, I we really would feel in that I think that there's tons of really incredible individuals, too much time to go through all of them. At the same time, the teams that are behind all of this is really what makes this happen. Um, so the implementation team of the Directive on Automated Decision-Making System at Treasury Board is also uh, huge. But then um, companies like AltaML and Element AI that are making these things happen, I think we are happening all over the country. Um, and CFAR, like there's lots and lots of great stuff going on. So um, there's tons and tons of champions in Canada on this. So check it out, be curious. Be curious, I love that. Thanks so much everyone for tuning in and over to Catherine or Nancy. I'm not sure where this goes next, but thanks. <laughs> it's me. Thank you, Skydra. And thanks Ashley, Phil and Stephen for this very informative and interactive discussion. I'm gonna watch the evolution of data governance and tools both here in Canada and globally with great interest. Uh, and I hope to see barriers to public access in the discussion either reduced or removed. And I will definitely read the Digital Charter Implementation Act. Thank you so much to our online participants for engaging with our panel. There were some great questions. Thanks so much. Next slide. So it's now time for our last break. Once again, while you're refueling, I encourage you to stay close while you hear a word from the Canadian IGF's platinum sponsor and my organization, Canary. My colleague, Catherine Antonison, We'll be diving into more questions about data governance, and I will see you back in 15 minutes. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you to the CIGF for this invitation to participate in this great event. Um, reflecting on just we what we just heard um, from our panel, from Phil and Stephen and Ashley, it really relates very much to, to the world Canary lives in and what Canary does. And for those of you who don't know, Canary is a federally funded not-for-profit organization and we have been around for 27 years essentially to help Canadians adopt and leverage digital technologies to make their lives better. Our, our mission is to advance Canada's knowledge and innovation infrastructure to benefit us all what we're most well known for is uh, being the federal partner for Canada's National Research and Education Network. And for those of you who may be not familiar with the network or the NREN as it's known, it is a private and purpose-built ultra-fast network that connects almost 800 institutions across the country, universities, colleges, uh, research hospitals, government research labs. So when you talk about data, that network is built to manage the data that is the lifeblood of research in Canada and globally. So when we think about some of the things that, that the panel was talking about, um, you know, Phil talked about 
um, coalitions and partnerships. Uh, Stephen talked about accountability, portability, integrity. Ashley talked about data governance and standards. All of those things that relate to the personal data that they were speaking about also relate to research data. And, and I'm happy to, to take questions, but I'll give you a sense of, of the environment for research data um, in Canada and globally. And I'll start, there's an image that has stuck with me. Uh, my colleague, Mark Leggett, is Executive Director of Research Data Canada. I'll come back to that. But the image that is stuck in my mind, Mark talked about uh, data. There's something called a whale fall in uh, ocean science. And so a whale carcass falls to the bottom of the sea. And as it disintegrates, it becomes the home and the lunchbox for thousands of other organisms that feed on that carcass and then go off and, and propagate. And he used that as a way to describe research data in any number of disciplines that can be tremendously useful when opened up and made available to other scientists in that discipline or to other scientists in other disciplines to support this multidisciplinary um, approach that increasingly we need to address our, our most pressing global challenges like climate change and food security and you know, water preservation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when our panelists were talking about, about the issues that they're grappling with and, they're, and that Canadians need to think about in terms of our personal data, there's kind of a, a parallel conversation going on in the research community. Uh, because you can imagine if you are a researcher, say, in genomics, you want to be sure that your research data set is, follows the standards and practices that make it useful for other genomicists uh, across the country so that this tremendous kind of treasure chest of data is made more broadly available. So here in Canada, actually, we're moving quite far along down a path. and and of making data more widely available and addressing those issues around standards and policies is really uh, done by a group called Research Data Canada, which is funded by Canary. And they are a group of individuals, um, data management specialists that work as a collaborative, because everything in, in research is a collaboration, to develop appropriate standards and practices so that we can make these data more widely available in a way that preserves and protects the integrity of the data, uh, make sure that only the right people can access that data, um, and also, and almost, and, and very importantly, so that the, the standards that we apply here in Canada align with standards for global data, because there's a global organization called Research Data Alliance that is also working collaboratively, collaboratively with jurisdictions around the world uh, to ensure that this incredible trove of data is available widely uh, among researchers to drive further innovations and, and drive further knowledge creation. So when, when the panelists talked about the partnerships, integrity, data sovereignty, um, protection, privacy, all of those things relate equally to research data in Canada, but there is an organization and a group of professionals who are working um, to advance this. Some other things you, you might um, want to think about in terms of, of research data, uh, Ashley, I think, talked about participatory governance. And increasingly, we see in a number of research domains, there's what we call participatory science or citizen science. And there are platforms um, across Canada and globally where citizens can engage with research data. Municipalities and governments have also opened up data sets, but I'm thinking of one research platform in particular. Some of you may be familiar with Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, they're kind of our networked ocean laboratory off the coast of Vancouver Island. And one of their products is called Digital Fishers. And, and Digital Fishers allows you, because they have all of these instruments and cameras going continuously on the ocean floor, Digital Fishers allows you to go in and view the video from one of these undersea cameras and make notations as to what you see. Um, so it's very interactive. It opens up 
well, it, it has a number of, of great benefits, but you know, it opens up ocean science to a whole new generation of young scientists. It, it makes it accessible to Canadians um, uh, across the country and it, and it enriches um, the ability of those scientists at Ocean Networks Canada to manage those enormous uh, data sets because there just aren't enough hours in the day for the scientists to view uh, the videos. So many of the issues that we see in that were raised by the panel in, in AI and data governance have an analog um, in the research field and we have, I think all of us as, as Canadians, have because the federal government and our tax dollars for the most part funds much of the research that is done in Canada we want to ensure that that data uh, the efficacy of that data is maximized and so we want to ensure that there are standards and practices in place around these data sets that there are pathways for individuals the right individuals to get access to these data sets and to use them to the benefit uh, of their individual research domains, but also for the benefit of all Canadians as we all work together to advance knowledge and use that knowledge to develop policies and practices that uh, make for a healthier, happier, more equitable society for us all. So Canary is very involved in this funding uh, research data Canada and, and the standards and practices, but we also have a program in research data management tools which funds research communities to develop the tools that allow them uh, to leverage that data uh, within their communities and to build communities of practice around the management of data that makes it kind of second nature as a researcher uh, to uh, format your data in a specific way, to follow specific data management policies, so that this whole new generation of scientists growing up now are growing up with an open science viewpoint, if you will, and that we're working to give them the tools and the processes to make it easy for them to make their research data open and, and as value and, and leverage that value across the broadest possible community. So that's a bit of Canary and a bit of research data management in a nutshell. I'm happy to take any questions uh, you may have. Alyssa, I know we have a few more minutes in our, uh, in our time here. And I don't know if there are any questions from the community. All right, again, I want to thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to join you this afternoon. It's been a great afternoon at the CIGF, and I will throw it back to my colleague and governance expert, Nancy Carter. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks so much for your very clear description of what, what we do. And I love the story about the whale. One of my favorite um, things that I remember uh, about ONC and their um, citizen science was the um, story about the, the young boy who became a citizen scientist and made a huge discovery about an unknown um, creature um, in the sea. So great, thanks. Uh, so welcome back everyone. Next slide, please. So far in the last couple of days, We've talked about a number of issues related to internet access, security, and privacy, and trust. Our next panel addresses what I think is one of the most fundamental issues related to internet governance, and that is digital literacy. This final session will explore the challenges and opportunities for building digital capacity and a safer cyber community in this evolving landscape as well as navigate the concerns around internet related threats and challenges of misinformation and the digital divide. I welcome the moderator for this session, my colleague, best boss ever, and the president and CEO of Canary, Jim Gadben. Jim's leadership, technical expertise and focus on stakeholder needs support and increased impact and relevance of Canary programs and services in Canada's public and private sectors. He's also a collaborator on the global stage 
as a member of the NREN CEO Forum to guide the evolution of the global research and education network. Jim, over to you. I've been looking forward to this discussion. Uh, geez, thanks, Nancy, for that introduction. I was only joking about uh, changing it to say best boss ever, but uh, I mean, that's, that's awfully sweet of you to say. So um, you so far with me joining this call, you are now being exposed to 60% of the Canary executive team. We had Catherine and uh, Nancy and now me. And uh, gives you an idea of how, how important um, the work of the CIGF is to uh, Canary and why we're a platinum sponsor. I am very, very pleased uh, to moderate this panel. It covers something that uh, is very near and dear to us all, and that is the human factor. Um, we have uh, some amazing uh, panelists. I, we, I was had the pleasure of meeting them all uh, last week during the intro session. I think you're gonna get a lot of uh, very informative and very provocative thinking. Um, as, as well, one of the key things we hope to leave you with is a better understanding of the challenges of digital literacy and uh, essentially what we need to do to work together to, uh, to, to, to move it along, essentially a call to action. Now, we, we have uh, only 55 minutes to cover this topic. Uh, we encourage you to ask any questions along the way. We will try to get, the, get to them all. Don't wait until uh, at the end of the event to, su to suggest questions. And so it'll give uh, Alyssa and us, the folks at Sierra, enough time to upvote them and, and, and uh, let us answer the most pressing questions you have. Uh, without, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, the first uh, to introduce you, and these are kind of coming in in uh, alphabetical order, uh, Daphne uh, Nostrom. Daphne is a content design expert and digital transformation leader who's passionate about championing practices that help the most vulnerable thrive in today's digital society. Uh, you know, that's a very, very uh, noble uh, uh, role, Daphne. Uh, she is currently a senior manager of the content design chapter at the Ontario Digital Service. Prior to that, she founded and led the digital training team at the Ontario Digital Service. Please welcome Daphne. Say hi to everyone, Daphne. Hello. Uh, next is, is Le, uh, Lequan uh, Collins Bacchus. Lequan is currently an advisor to the Treasury Board of Canada uh, Secretariat working on files related to the Digital Nine. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Digital Nine, uh, it is a formation similar to the G7, G whatever, uh, that includes Estonia, which is a very progressive uh, digital country, Israel, South Korea, New Zealand, UK, Canada, Uruguay, Mexico, and Portugal. Good government in the 21st century requires the gover that governments offer their citizens quality digital services. So please welcome uh, Le Kwan because she will bring to us a huge component of uh, a huge insight into not only the domestic, but in the, in the international context for digital liter literacy. I don't know, I don't, don't see, um, is, is, I don't see, is, okay, I'll continue. <laughs> All right, I am switching to my earbuds here to hopefully, um, Hello, I'm continuing. Uh, next is Matthew Johnson. Matthew is the Director of Education for Media Smart, Smarts, Canada's Center for Digital and Media Literacy. He is the architect of Media Smarts use, use rather, understand, create digital literacy framework for Canadian K-12 schools and, and the Media Literacy 101 and Digital Literacy 101 professional development programs and has been involved in creating professional recommendations relating to screen time, sexual education, online hate, artificial intelligence, and many other topics. And the, the lastly on the panel is Maureen James. Hi, Maureen. Maureen is, Maureen's current session is working with others to create a new tradition of digital philanthropy in Canada. 
not 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 for at least uh, digital liter literacy projects, which ranked highest in terms of funding need in in Canada. So this she's uh, she works at Sarah, and Sarah has a uh, a program to provide funding into the uh, community. Her sincere hope is that everyone will be able to say digital philanthropy five times fast by the end of 2020. <laughs> Her employment history is entirely with not-for-profits, uh, which is a welcome change for her as compared to her prior roles in, in that her position at Sierra actually allows her to give money to the community rather than constantly find additional funding for their mission. Making lemon from, uh, lemonade from lemons, uh, in April she decided to focus on learning the violin versus the accordion. Uh, she's much happier with that choice, but she's not sure that her family and neighbors are as well. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcome, welcoming Maureen and the other panelists. Okay, I, I'm, I'm continuing along here. Uh, I just muted myself. I think I'm doing this. Uh, all right, uh, so. Let's kick this, kick this off. Let's set a, let's set a, a benchmarking for everyone. Um, digital literacy, I mean, can have multiple multiple meetings. And as I mentioned last week, we, I, I met many of these people, and uh, we decided that it would be useful to set a benchmark. So I'm going to ask Matthew um, if Merriam-Webster or the Oxford English Dictionary were to ring you up and say we're looking for a definition of digital literacy, what would you want it to include? For us, digital literacy is something that we look at through the lens of media literacy. Basically, digital literacy is an extension of media literacy. So we define media literacy as being able to access, to analyze, to evaluate, and produce media. We also look at it in terms of being an active rather than a passive consumer of media. So when we bring digital literacy to the mix, we take that definition and we add what is distinctive about digital media relative to traditional media, and that is that it's not a one-way medium, it's interactive, that uh, it's a network rather than a transmission chain. And so all of a sudden we get a lot of new implications uh, around things like ethics, around things like interactivity, around things like privacy, and around things like civic engagement that weren't present with traditional media. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a great definition. Uh, for the other panelists, uh, do you have anything you, you want to uh, add to that or, or maybe even uh, amend? No? All right, moving on from there. Yeah. Uh, Daphne, um, can, you know, you've had basically you have a considerable experience in this. Can you sort of uh, help the audience understand why does digital literacy even matter? Can you hear me? Excellent. Okay, yes. Um, where do I start? Um, so, when I think of digital literacy, um, there are multiple actors and players with regard to that. So, for the average person, it really comes down to having the skills um, to be able to navigate um, our digital society. Um, specifically, the skills to stay safe online, um, to find credible sources, to identify misinformation, um, and to make informed decisions, right, about um, what people consume. And so, um, specifically, you know, um, it's understanding more and more the implications of our choices. As things become easier to use, or a good example I can think of is um, Instagram, right? Um, you know, you don't need to be a photographer to be able to apply filters, et cetera. Um, but that's a simple example in terms of the technology that we have at hand. But what are the implications of uploading, um, you know, your contacts into a social media platform? What are the implications of um, giving all of this information, let's say, if you do a social media quiz, all of these things? Um, and so for the public, digital literacy means um, understanding 
the implications of their choices, um, having the skills to be able to get the jobs that uh, perhaps they want, and then to grow in those jobs. Um, and more and more, it means really being a lifelong learner. Um, so that's what digital literacy means in that context. For government, Digital literacy uh, means having the skills to be able to build the things that align with uh, people's needs in a digital era. Uh, people are used to what I call an Amazon world. They're used to getting information and products sort of at, at their fingertips. How do we in government, um, you know, uh, deliver to people in that context? How do we build services that doesn't leave anyone behind? Um, so that no matter where people fit in that spectrum of digital literacy, they're still able to get access to our services. And increasingly, um, as, as government agents, um, how do we become stewards of public good so that um, whatever we do, whatever data we, we gather and harness, we're doing it in a way that doesn't hurt society, but that supports society. Um, one of the things that um, keep me up at night with regards to digital literacy is this idea that the private sector is more and more kind of solving public problems. What does that mean for us in government um, as, as we try to um, ensure that we stay in step with society and the skills needed to be able to um, deliver um, on our uh, responsibility to support people um, wherever they, they might be in terms of you know, the province or um, uh, their own journey in terms of digital literacy. So there's lots of questions. It matters to me on so many different levels. Um, yeah, so that would be my, my take on that. So we did, we did have a question uh, queued up for Laquan, but, uh, and she would hope maybe provide us a, a bit more context into the next question, but we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of call uh, what's in the football vernacular a bit of an audible here. I'm going to ask Matt to sort of uh, comment on um, how you would characterize the state of digital literacy in Canada. Like, where, where do you think we are as a country? You know, what's interesting about that question is that we really don't know. Um, there's partly because there's the division of responsibilities between the provinces uh, and territories and the federal government, uh, with education falling, of course, to the provinces. Um, there isn't really good um, national data uh, about digital literacy levels. Um, and that's not true in every country. You know, in the UK, uh, Ofcom, which is essentially their equivalent of the CRTC, it has part of its mandate research into media literacy and digital literacy levels, not just in youth, but in adults as well. And that's data that's really lacking. So at Media Smarts, we do do research periodically. We, we aim to do it every five years, where among other things, we get a, a bit of a gauge of young people's digital literacy skills. But of course, I, I think what the last few years have shown us is that these digital literacy skills are things that we as adults did not learn. Um, and so there really is an urgent need to find out how digitally literate Canadians in general are, both uh, better finer grain data on youth, but also data on adults, which we really don't have at all. So uh, for, for the entire panel, um, what would be what would be a reasonable way to assess like what 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 evidence would show that we are moving ahead like what what would be something that you would look at and say ah that's happening now so therefore we must be progressing uh, um, along this path um, any ideas on that I, I can take that one um, so as, for me it's about the kinds of questions people are asking right. Um, meaning uh, in, in government, for example, we, we talk about uh, leadership and the role that they play in bringing about transformation and empowering their teams to, to work in ways that are in line with what you would expect with an, a digital era team. And one of those things are, you know, are, um, are we talking to the users? Are we talking to the public um, in a really transparent way and truly listening to their concerns? Um, uh, do we have the right people and the right skill set on a team? And so all of these questions imply a certain amount of awareness, at the very least, 
of um, what's needed in order to get the job done, whatever the job might be. Um, for individuals, uh, for me, that would be, you know, why are you asking all these questions? Why are you gathering all this information? You know, perhaps this is somebody who's filling out a questionnaire somewhere and, um, and you know, um, and they're noticing that a range of information, like, you know, their address, things that are not needed for whatever it is that they need to get done. Maybe they're applying for something and they're asking, they're taking a step and asking the company or the organization or whoever why they're asking um, for a certain amount of information. So they have an awareness of how much data is sufficient for a particular task. Um, uh, it could also be uh, people asking for plain language terms of service, right? Um, we know that folks don't read the terms of service, right? But wouldn't it be interesting if more and more users actually reached out to whatever company and said, I can't understand your terms of service, write it in a language that works for me so I understand what I am willfully or unwillingly um, saying yes to. So those are some of the benchmarks for me. Okay. Um, Ma Ma Maureen, um, building on that, um, what would you say within Canada or even just globally, what, what challenges or roadblocks do we have in terms of moving down that path to improve digital literacy? Well, um, I heard something very interesting at the content moderation panel yesterday, which I think shows we have a serious challenge in that they said that digital literacy was not as exciting as internet regulation or social media platform governance. Like if that's not a challenge, I don't know. <laughs> Seriously? No. Um, I think from my perspective, it's interesting, you're talking about how would we know if we're making any progress. And at CIRA, we run a funding program that includes digital literacy. Um, and so one way I think is, well, are we getting fewer or more requests for digital literacy projects? Like we've had quite a surge in requests for those kind of projects, and maybe that's a good sign. Maybe it's a sign that people know that they need this, or is it a sign that it's a big problem that it's not being dealt with? So. From my perspective, um, I'll put forward that funding is a huge challenge no matter how you look at those benchmarks because we've done some research recently that looked at the digital funding landscape in Canada and specifically from the perspective of the fact that we run a granting program for nonprofits, registered charities and academics and the top concern about gaps in funding was digital literacy. It was the highest, it rank, ranked as the most important funding gap. And so I think that is a very important uh, problem that we need to address. And I think a lot of people think that government is taking care of it. They think, you know, government funding is out there and that will cover up what we need to do in digital literacy. And really what we heard from the people that we researched with was that the requirements for that funding are really out of reach for most small community-based organizations, which are a lot of the ones we work with who need accessible, long-term mm -hmm. funding that is for very specific defined projects that are, are led by those communities. Um, so I think for us, one of the messages, did I say I wanted people to learn how to say digital philanthropy five times fast? I'm sure we're gonna be able to do it by the end of this panel. I'm moving up my benchmark to the end of the panel, <laughs> not 2020. So just uh, first, first, uh, I mean, I commend I commend the work that Sarah does in this regard. I mean, I, I, I'm uh, obviously very the two organizations, Canary and Sarah, have a common mandate to advance Canada into the digital era. When when you look at submissions for this program, uh, Maureen, I mean, what what would you say characterizes a, a great a description of what it would do for digital literacy versus ones that may 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 not be as great that you would say we prefer to give the, the the funding to this particular initiative because it actually has uh, some characteristics. Could you thinking back in terms of the evaluation? What are the attributes of really good proposals to advance digital literacy? That's a tough question. And again, again, I think it actually came through more in our research than it does in the applications because we get amazing applications. We get too many. We can't fund them all. Uh, we do $1.25 million a year and we get dozens more that, that we can't actually fulfill. Um, I think in terms of projects that are that we really think hit the mark are the ones that are very much defined by the community so you'll see projects like we, we have a, a specific focus right now on 
uh, obviously K to 12, but also projects taking place in northern uh, remote and indigenous communities. So that has kind of skews it a certain way because we realize that there are needs that are greater in many of those communities. So we have funded quite a range of things. And what gives us confidence, I think, in how we fund them is how they present where the project came from and who it's going to serve and that really kind of local context. So one of the examples I cite quite often is that it's, there are a lot of older people. Um, we have supported projects in uh, a project in Montreal that's supporting people uh, over 50 living with HIV that wanted, the, the project was presented as we want to train these people on how to find health information because it's hard to find and it'll give them a way to use the internet. What actually ended up happening was these people needed basic, like, how do you turn on your computer and use it safely skills. So it really changed from a content project to an agency project around how you send an email, how you connect with people, how you create content to share with people on Facebook and social media. And we've done a number of those kinds of projects with seniors groups um, across Canada. But then there's also ones that are focused on, on kids, you know, kids in school, like Connected North, who you would have heard about yesterday, that are doing the interactive two-way video curriculum to 100 Northern schools for Indigenous students to interact with Indigenous role models. Um, we do curriculum development for, well, we don't do it. We work with organizations that do curriculum development, for example, on artificial intelligence, uh, a really awesome project that we funded, I think, this past year was quite unique, a digital version of a high school play about online pornography. So teens can learn how to navigate healthy sexuality online. So they see a display and they actually get to see kind of the same questions when they go online and see all of this stuff that's like, oh my God, how do I, how do I sort through all of this, right? So really kind of uh, unique initiatives um, and for us, all of them are pretty impressive when all, when all is said and done. And of course, I wouldn't, it would be remiss of me not to mention Media Smarts because Media Smarts and Sarah have, been, have, have had long term partnership in terms of support of the amazing work that they're doing in terms of helping young Canadians lead healthy online lives. So I don't think I have a one size fits all answer at all for what you asked, Jim, because I think mm -hmm. the way we look at it is very much defined by communities. Um, and their specific needs. And that came through very much in our philanthropy research also, that, that it's there, it, the, the specific needs of a community and small level, and although they want sustained funding, it really, leaving it to be defined by communities for what they need is what works best. So I'm, I'm gonna maybe show a bit of my age here, but I'm gonna channel my, uh, my John F. Kennedy for you, Maureen. Like we don't ask, ask these questions because they're easy. We ask them because they are hard, um, <laughs> which, which is a segue to one of the questions that's come from the audience back for you, Matthew. Uh, Somebody, uh, there's, a, there's a question about the definition uh, that, that uh, is being sort of shared today. The question comes from Garth Graham and it is, Digital literacy defines the issue in terms of the media it replaces, for example, horseless carriages. Now that's somebody that's even going further back than John F. <laughs> Kennedy. Uh, is, there a, is there a better term to reframe the issue as digital? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, we, we, we kind of look at digital literacy as a special case of media literacy, uh, that it's included within media literacy. Um, but that there are aspects of digital media that we don't find with traditional uh, media. So honestly, if the term digital literacy had not existed when we were developing our framework and everything, uh, my preference would be for the term networked media literacy, because that really is what is distinct. And there are digital media experiences that you can completely address with traditional media literacy. So a single player video game, for instance, is an entirely digital experience, but it's not really that different from, you know, reading a choose your own adventure book, if you remember those. 
Um, it is, it's not really, I mean, it's interactive within a certain ambit, but it, you're not actually interacting with other people. You're not sending signals back. So all of the, all of the implications, you know, there's no cyberbullying, there's no privacy concerns, there's no ethical concerns. All of those things that we associate with networked media aren't found there. So really that I think is the key. And that is why our, our first key concept and most fundamental key concept of digital literacy is that digital media are networked and all of our other key concepts, other, all the other things that we explore and all the other analytical lenses that we use are implications of that one. Thanks, thanks for that. So I'm gonna go, uh, there's a couple more questions coming from uh, the audience and keep them coming, but I'm gonna uh, cycle back to uh, the discussion around the impact of uh, digital literacy. Uh, a, question, a, a question for you, uh, Daphne, is uh, what happens if we don't actually address some of these challenges? Like, how does, how does society suffer? How does Canada suffer? How does humanity suffer? Good question. Um, I would say, well, there are a lot of, okay, a lot of things can happen. How do we suffer? So, number one, um, as we've seen, uh, particularly when it comes to um, social issues, the rise of, you know, um, fake campaigns online, um, just, you know, um, to gather support around a particular cause, but the people who, you know, set up these social media um, campaigns, who are running them, they're literally uh, folks who stand against those causes for, you know, um, human rights. And so the issue with that is that you have people who are being manipulated um, and manipulated in ways that are against their own best human rights interests. Right. Um, you know, I think the days where, you know, you could you see a meme and you think, oh, that's so fake um, are behind us. Right. Uh, folks have gotten very sophisticated at manufacturing a lot of um, misinformation. And so what does that mean when you have a society that is completely misinformed? A, a good example would be with COVID. Um, you know, what happens when people don't have access to the information? They need to stay safe. They need to keep their loved ones safe. That's what's at stake. And, you know, what happens when people don't have the skills to be able to apply discernment, when they don't know truth from fiction, um, and they don't know where to turn to find the information? That could save lives, right? And so that's what's at stake. Um, and that's sort of, you know, at the macro level. Um, another example is, you know, when we think about digital literacy in the context of people who have, you know, those already those advanced technical skills, like say software developers, right? Um, then digital literacy in that context would mean having a certain amount of empathy to understand how what they build um, affects uh, you know, how people understand and are able to navigate certain things. So, for example, um, you know, what happens when um, Uber decides to, you know, say this, you know, business is worth your money and this business is not? How does that impact the bottom, bottom line for that business? But also, how does that impact the user who, um, whose choices have now been limited? That's just one example, but um, the idea is that what we build, both as the people who create the things, the digital products that people consume, and what we consume as those who are the recipients of those things, requires a certain amount of literacy. And um, that literacy, if we don't have it, where our ability to get uh, the service that we deserve goes down the drain. Um, our ability to have our rights respected as individual gets diminished. Um, and, and so what does that end up meaning in the long term, right? Um, so I think to, to answer that plainly, um, the price of not knowing how to navigate in a digital world is our freedom. And perhaps wow. that's in degrees, in varying degrees, but that's our freedom. Absolutely.
<laughs> wow. Wow. That's all I can say about that. I mean, I, I, you know, I hope, hope we, we, we address this problem long before something like that happens. But, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, dovetails with one of the questions that has come from, uh, the, from the audience. It's a question from uh, Jean-Francois uh, Maize. I hope I said that uh, last name correctly. Um, has the Trump era changed priorities in terms of digital literacy to increase priority uh, of qualifying the quality slash source of data you see on the internet? Essentially, uh, um, the way I the way I would sort of personally characterize it is the weaponization of of uh, keep keep parts of the internet to the point you just uh, made, Daphne. So. Anybody want to? Anybody want to jump in? It's just kind of uh, we're, we're living in very odd times. Um, anybody dare to hazard to make a non-political comment around a very politically charged topic? Well, I can talk about it from the Canadian context, and you know, try to keep politics out of it, except to note that it's really made a huge change in how much attention is being paid to. The, the critical analytical, as, analytical aspect of digital literacy um, and to you know, media literacy as well. So for a long time, um, what we refer to as authenticating information, you know, recognizing misinformation, disinformation, that, that was kind of the redheaded stepchild of digital literacy. It was a lot easier to find funding for things like cyberbullying and uh, privacy and cybersecurity, you know, which are all important issues. Um, but until about four years ago, it was hard to get people to really appreciate um, the importance of being able to verify online information and recognize mis and disinformation. And that has changed so much so quickly. You know, two years ago, we did a study of uh, Canadian parents, and overall, misinformation was their top concern for their kids. Um, it was ahead of cyberbullying, it was ahead of sexting, it was ahead of privacy, it was ahead of sexual and violent content. Uh, it was the, the number one concern. And so this is huge, uh, and you know, and of course, there's always a, a concern that we overcorrect, um, you know, that now maybe there are other issues that aren't getting as much attention and should be getting attention. But, you know, I can say that this has shone a light on a really, really important issue and a really key challenge for us, um, you know, as uh, I think has really been, uh, really been illustrated again, uh, by, by the pandemic, how much we get our information now online and how much online discourse influences so much of our lives. Yeah, um, I don't know, Maureen, if you want to uh, add, add anything to that. Um, um, as the mother of a redhead, I'm not sure how to take the stepchild comment. Yeah, <laughs> but, but so, that's so, pretty much so, it. So you know the, uh, the uh, Nancy, uh, Nancy and Catherine would sort of attest to the amount of training we're putting into the staff at Canary, and the one, the one thing that we, we continue to, to uh, drill into them, especially as you, is with the online presence with uh, aggressive phishing attacks, is is the need for the individual to sort of step up their level of skepticism, right? Uh, before you before you buy into something, you should maybe take a second pause. Uh, uh, Matthew, you talked about um, you know the, the reaction of par uh, parents with their children and, and the need for education there, but but how do we how do we also train the adults? How, how do how do we how do we encourage um, a society that that uh, to sensitize them to the, the level of misinformation uh, they're being bombarded with? That's a really good question, and it is something we've been struggling with. Um, because of course, with kids, there is uh, th there is the K to twelve system um, where we can deliver content. It's still a challenge there. Of course, getting that, getting it in classrooms, getting it in teachers' hands, um, f helping teachers find the time. But still, that there is that distribution system, and we don't have that for adults. So we have been doing a public awareness campaign. Uh, we started last year. Uh, our Break the Fake campaign, which uh, brought back the, the house hippo, which many uh, 80s and 90s kids will remember. And that was a real advantage for us because there were a lot of adults now who remember that. 
Um, but still, th I think this really is a, an indication of uh, that, that the federal government uh, has a, an important role to play, I think, in bringing this to people's awareness across the country. Um, there is a lot of evidence that we can shift attitudes through public awareness campaigns, through careful messaging. Um, if we make, if we have a clear action item, we provide people with really simple, clear and easy to do um, steps to take. And that is why, you know, our Break the Fake campaign focuses on four quick and easy steps that anyone can use to verify or debunk information online. And you know, once you've done them, once you've learned how to do them, none of them should take you more than about 30 to 60 seconds to do. And that is what we need. Uh, we need to have uh, a, a campaign. We need to have a national effort to make verification as automatic and as universal as driving safety. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there, that there's um, that we've seen a really good example uh, out in BC of a project that is directly focused on seniors doing exactly the thing that you're talking about, Matthew, which is taking them through that process of here's your technology, here's how it works, here's the news, here's how you sort through what you're finding online and forwarding to your family and your grandchildren and your whoever, right? And it's, it's, they're all retired, so it's a whole retired network thing that's happening through unions and those kind of groups where people are already connected with each other, and it's been making really good progress in that kind of thing. But I agree. I think you can have a bunch of these small initiatives that are filling the gap until there's a larger, a larger uh, national approach. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I think we can all relate to that. Anyone that's sort of reasonably tech savvy will get brought into a family or friend, a member, and they'll say, my laptop or my computer is not uh, is not behaving properly. And then you will ask them a series of questions. And they'll say, oh, no, I didn't do anything. I mean, it just, it just uh, all of a sudden started only to realize they must have clicked on 50 links that have either infected them or, or done something uh, horrible. And um, so that, that that's a very chronic, chronic I issue. Uh, a question, another question, this one comes from somebody named Annie, Annie Amos, anonymous rather, sorry, uh, somebody who's not, not willing to tell us who they are. But I think this question, this question uh, was a question I would have asked yesterday on the panel uh, that was in the morning and well, in the afternoon around moderating uh, online content. And um, my question would have been kind of like, uh, what are the characteristics of some of these online, um, online platforms that, that, that will promote sort of more of a cult behavior. Uh, the question from Anonymous, which is very related, um, which, which is how much of these are, as in quotes, choices, and how much are engineered dopamine drips, which is essentially giving us a hit as we get sort of programmed uh, from, from these things. Anybody want to take a shot at that one? Sure. Um, so I, I like this question for a number of reasons. I think um, what that hints at for me is this idea of what I call digital hygiene, right? So beyond uh, knowing how to use digital products, uh, whether that's social media, whether that's um, an app, et cetera, is um, knowing, um, you know, the implications, like I said, of our choices, knowing when to step back, when to take a break from, you know, consumption, of um, the various digital channels that we subscribe to, um, and which really implies understanding how being in front of a screen impacts our brain. Um, you know, like as we've learned, as many people have learned um, through, um, you know, our recent sort of mass move to working from home, um, the need to have what's called digital hygiene, the need to, you know, you're, you're not going to spend 12 hours in front of a screen. You should take breaks at regular intervals, um, you know, uh, you, et cetera, all of these things. And similarly, with the things that are created for us, as it becomes easier for us to use, they, they come with this sense of this aha feeling, right, which implies this dopamine feel, right? You, you feel good using this and you keep scrolling, et cetera. Um, 
and it kind of keeps you hooked and, and keeps you moving through a particular, uh, you know, your feed or whatever that looks like. And so many of these well-designed systems are designed to keep you on the platform. So part of that literacy is understanding that. So if you know that, you know, this product is designed to keep you there, right? Um, at some point, you know, you, you want to be that person who says, okay, you know what, I've been here for an hour. Uh, that's enough cat videos for the day. I'm going to take a break, whatever that looks like, and I'm going to come back. And, and we need to teach that to our kids too, right? Um, we, we don't want to tell people and, or ourselves or our children that no, stay away from digital products because they're part of our society. What we do need to do is to develop a responsible relationship with these things that we consume so that even when they're engineered to keep us hooked, we have a certain element of choice simply because we come at it with a level of awareness. Um, so that would be uh, my response to that. The flip side of it, with regard to the folks who are engineering these things that keep people hooked, again, it comes back to what I was saying earlier around the software developer or whoever building the services who has a certain amount of empathy, who has a certain, so the ethical implications of the things that we build and, and, and sort of building checks and balances so that Yes, we want people to keep using them, but at the same time, we, we don't want um, to contribute to another level. What happened there? I think we lost, did we lose uh, Daphne? Or did I, is that? Maureen and uh, Matthew, can you hear me? Am I back? I can, oh yes, yeah, I can you're back. Me. Yeah, welcome, welcome, welcome okay. back, uh, Daphne. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ultimately, what I was saying is, you know, we just need the skill to be able to make informed choices, and that will mitigate the impact of these things that are uh, engineered to keep us hooked. And on the flip side of it, those people who build it, ideally, um, they also, you know, get the kind of literacy training that uh, engenders a kind of empathy, so that they're not building things that keep us addicted. So, I mean, this is uh, clearly um, uh, been a very provocative panel and a very good discussion because the number of questions keep coming in from um, um, the uh, audience. So I'll, I'll read another one and so, so that everybody knows. We also had a bunch of uh, questions we wanted to get to, but we're, we're happier to actually answer the questions from the community uh, to take advantage of the, the incredible knowledge of the panelists. Um, this one might have already been uh, touched on a bit, uh, I think, in, in uh, Maureen, in your answer in terms of what's going on in British Columbia, but I'll, I'll read it anyway. This one came from uh, Hossein, who uh, moderated a panel uh, yesterday, uh, which is, uh, any plan to address the internet literacy combined with the language barrier, which is different than just the senior issue, uh, for seniors and I guess newcomers, which, you know, the sort of immigrants and, and other people that come to Canada where English and, and uh, French are necessarily their, their uh, first language. Maureen, you want to take yeah, that? I'm, I guess I'm chagrined to say that we are aware of that through our grant applications. We've seen those projects, for example, that are trying to address that issue, but we have a limit. So anybody else who wants to like open a wallet and share some more money about how we can actually fund a lot of these really fantastic initiatives, the more opportunities there are, those projects do exist. There are great agencies all across Canada that are working on these things. So that's my perspective on that. I'm aware of them, but uh, not all of the projects that we see can be funded. Uh, uh, okay, uh, anybody else have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say we do have a program that we are rolling out currently through YW, YWCA called Digital Smarts, and that is aimed specifically at uh, people from uh, marginalized or underserved groups, so seniors certainly, but also uh, you know recent immigrants. Um, and uh, that was something we were very conscious of, where we we worked with a literacy consultant. Uh, to make sure that it was as accessible as possible in English and French. Um, but you know, we're also always looking for opportunities to translate and adapt our material to additional languages. 
um, to reach more people. Um, and we've had, you know, we've had some opportunities to do that. Um, but again, as Maureen says, it is so often a, not a question of funding. So uh, a fun question for, for you, Matthew, that comes from Josh. Um, is that a house hippo behind you, uh, behind you Matthew? Inquiring yes. minds must know. Yes, I, I always keep him. I, I keep him behind me, right at the edge of my, uh, right at the edge of my screen. Um, and uh, who knows, there may be one lurking in your house too. <laughs> <laughs> so James Kerr asked a question that I, that uh, I, uh, unfortunately Laquan La uh, had uh, some um, difficult technical problems that, that were unable to be resolved, and actually were resolved. But she she felt that it, joining late in the panel that. She would have missed a lot of context, but the question she she would have been ideal to answer, in my opinion, given that she's actually spent time in Estonia, and I actually been to Estonia uh, for a conference, and it is remarkably a fairly digital uh, country. And I, the, the, I think one of the main reasons, a couple of reasons for that, is, is the president when they're when they're, when they're put into position are still in their forties, and so kind of are, are a little bit more current with the technology. Um, I, I mean, there are other issues besides just straight up uh, age, obviously. But the question is, is Canada too different from homogenous Estonia for us to change our government to a digital one? Um, anybody like, uh, I mean, I'll take a shot at it because uh, myself and then, and that, but, but only by a parallel. Uh, what we do at Canary is something that, that is actually replicated around the world. And, and when I first started at Canary, uh, our network and our services were being compared to what was called what was thought to be the gold standard in, in research and education networking and that was the network in the Netherlands and uh, if you look at the geography of the Netherlands it's I think it's uh, maybe about the size of New Brunswick if if, if that uh, probably even smaller than that uh, so it while while actually benchmarking is difficult and to, to try to factor in the heterogeneous nature of Canada with the federal provincial um, uh, think uh, uh, challenges we have. It, it's still useful to sort of understand what what is the state of the art. And so I think for Canada, we should be continuing to look at other countries and find out what they're actually doing, and then find a way to actually recognizing the Canadian governance governance model with federal and provincial and territorial splits to try to find a way to to, to work in that. Which kind of leads me to a question back to the panel because I, I you know, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not an expert in any of, of these things. Like, who would you say within Canada owns this problem, and and how do we how do we empower the audience because we're getting down to you know the, the last few minutes of of the of our session here. But who owns this problem and how do we get them to start to pay a lot more attention to this? Is this the problem that we all have? Or is it uh, something you would say the federal government has? Is it, or, is it not-for-profit organizations? Like who, who do you think is best armed to go after this, this specific challenge? Because it's very critical for, for society to actually have the literacy to participate in, in an online economy, to have safety for, their, for themselves and their families. So who wants to take a shot at that? Uh... I can contribute to that. I would say we all do. Uh, but certainly government um, uh, with the role that we play in shaping um, society, we, we, play, we have a huge role to play. Um, and to uh, dial it back a little bit with regards to the question around Estonia, I will say that digital is not a one size fits all kind of approach. Number one, the word digital is a little uh, misleading. It's confusing. Right, because when we when we say digital, really what we're saying is um, changing how we approach problems, um, what we value, how we work, what drives our, our decisions to align with our digital era reality. Really, that's what it comes down to. Um, and so, for government, um, specifically the Ontario Digital Service, our our whole reason for existing is about helping government transform the Ontario government specifically transform so that. Um, we can uh, meet the needs of a digital society. We can meet the needs of people and businesses. And so what that means for us is um, 
ensuring that we're always researching with the people, with the users of our services, testing our thinking, um, and continuously improving based on um, what we learn. It means, um, you know, uh, building with people, not just, like, you know, not just for people. So a really kind of uh, collaborative process. It means um, using data to drive our decisions and, and to respond accordingly. And internally, it means really transforming our systems. You know, um, you know, building teams that are nimble, that can respond to um, the needs that arise, having leadership that can empower their teams, and, um, and of course, having certain skill sets. Um, you know, designers, um, developers, um, content designers, uh, user researchers, et cetera. So that's sort of how we package digital transformation. Um, of course, what that looks like in Ontario versus what that looks like in Nova Scotia versus what that looks like for the Fed is going to look different. And we need all those actors and all those realities to work together to then surface um, or to create this digital reality that, that we talk about. And, but that does not leave out grassroots organizations. That does not leave out, um, you know, the individual person in the role that they play um, in, in continuously learning, et cetera, so that they can, you know, keep up with or rather participate in a digital society. So uh, that's a great answer, uh, great answer uh, Daphne. I'm going to just spin it, uh, the question just, just a bit for Maureen and... Uh, and uh, Matthew, you know, one of the one of the the, the key kind of at uh, sense of like an analogy for good leadership is you have not only a, a shepherd but you have a sheepdog, right? So the shepherd sort of leads the way, and then the, the, the sheepdog sort of makes sure that the that the the sheep are, are following the direction of the of the. Um, of, of the shepherd. So, in, in with that analogy, who would you say is the best? Um, shepherd and and how how do we ensure that we have the uh, uh, enough of a notion of of sheepdogs to make sure as a country we're kind of moving along? You didn't want easy questions, honestly. You did not want easy <laughs> questions. I'm feeling a bit sheepish right now. <laughs> um, I, I, not, I was I, sorry. I apologize. I'm not trying to stump the panel. I, I, I was just, you know, I'm just trying to make the the messages uh, very accessible to the audience because I believe there's a call to action here. We want to say, uh, where do we want to go with this? Well, yeah, and I, th I mean, I think that I think going back again to examples from other countries, I think that's really some place that we can look. We, and I'm speaking for the people that talk to us through our research, um, said these things are being dealt with better in other jurisdictions and we should be looking in those places. I'm still speaking largely from a funding perspective, but if you look at the tradition of digital philanthropy in the US and in Europe, not necessarily specifically focused on digital literacy, but there's much more of a, of a built up system around making these things happen. And I think that is one model we can look to. Um, and then one of, the, one of the recommendations that did come through in our research for what to do in this space is have a national association. That sounds scary to me, like what does that mean? But I think back to what Daphne was saying, it's, it's getting those kind of multi-stakeholder in a way groupings together to figure this out and to make sure that the voices that need to be at the table that currently aren't, the ones that always get left behind in these conversations have to be there. And I think if COVID's done anything for us, it's shown us that those voices that might even be disconnected completely right now need to be part of that conversation. And uh, Matthew, do you have, uh, you wanna add to that or uh, add additional context? I, I agree that there are some great models um, internationally that we can look at. And I think that's also true when it comes to uh, the federal government taking more of a leadership role. Um, so I already mentioned, for instance, the, the broadcast regulator in uh, the UK having a responsibility for research and de res developing resources on media and digital literacy. In Australia, they actually have an e-safety commissioner, uh, which is a model that's used in a few other countries as well, that identifies online safety and related issues specifically as 
a governmental responsibility, and they define that really broadly. So they have a lot of material around privacy and online relationships and things like that. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity even within the current division of, of powers, of course, which is not going to go anywhere, I think there is a lot of opportunity for leadership uh, from the federal government. And of course, there's a lot of opportunities for provincial governments uh, to come out in front as well, which we've sometimes seen uh, on areas like privacy, where at times provincial governments have been in the lead and at times it's been the federal government. So it would, what, would you, what would you say to the following then? Uh, if, uh, I heard a number of times that you sold a benchmark against other countries to sort of get a, a, an understanding of best practices. And we said, you know, the, generally, generally the, the pronoun being used is we should do that. But would you all agree that, the, 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 that really some, somehow the federal government actually does an, uh, an international comparison or charges some agency to do an international comparison and make recommendations? Would, would you be able to all get behind that? Because when we say we, I mean, yeah. somebody actually has to go yeah. and say, how does Canada compare? And certainly being a member of the, the D9 and, and maybe uh, the, the Quan would have been able to add a lot more context for us here. But um, would, 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 you, would, would that offend any of you if we said, well, somebody should do a benchmark, probably the best organization that should make sure it happens because it's an international thing is obviously our federal government. No, or Sarah. Or canary, but any any kind of no, any organization has a national maybe remit. Media Smart or some organization that's already oh. in the research field. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, it okay. has a track record. So. So, 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 so I think we're I think we're at the end of our time. But you know what? I I, I think the closing remarks are uh, coming from Byron, and maybe we can action him to say what what. Uh, <laughs> Who should who should uh, uh, own this problem? Listen, it's been it was fantastic meeting you all. Uh, it it's it's really opened up my my eyes to the challenges of this, and I certainly hope the the audience uh, got as much out of this as as I have. Uh, I want to congratulate you all. If we were live, I'm sure you would all be getting a fantastic applause for the for this panel. Um, all right. Uh, with that, I'll, I think I'm passing this back to either. Uh, does this go back to you, Nancy? Sure does. Thanks, Jim. Thank you to our final panel, our moderator, Jim, and our panelists, Daphne, Maureen, and Matthew. We missed you, Laquan, and I'm sorry we didn't get to hear from you today. Daphne, as someone who reads terms and conditions in EULAs, I would definitely appreciate greater accessibility. This conversation on digital literacy was certainly broader than I had anticipated, and I was really looking forward to this panel. So thank you to all of you. I leave with two new terms, digital hygiene and digital philanthropy, which I will practice saying five times fast. You've left us with several ideas and opportunities and calls to action to be incorporated into our summary report. Thank you. Before I introduce our final speaker, I want to take a few moments to once again thank our generous sponsors. Our presenting sponsor, the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, USERA. Our platinum sponsor, Canary. Our gold sponsor, Internet Society. And our partner sponsors, ICANN and Cybera. I also want to thank my colleagues on the steering and planning committees. And last but certainly not least, all the CIRA staff who worked behind the scenes this week and in the weeks prior to make this event a reality. Most of all though, I wanna thank you, all of our participants for your input. This has been an incredible two days and this is just the beginning. I look forward to continuing the discussion through the email list or through the newsletter for which you can sign up on the CIGF website. <clears throat> website which is canadianigf.ca. And of course, the conversation will continue on social media using the hashtag CIGF2020. Next slide. To close off this year's CIGF, I will now invite Byron Holland, President and CEO of the Canadian Internet Registration Authority to speak. Under Byron's leadership, CIRA has expanded its product and service offerings to Canadians and .ca has become one of the fastest growing country code top level domains in the world. Globally, Byron is widely recognized as a leader in internet governance, 
representing CIRA and the .ca domain in numerous industry fora. Byron, we look forward to your closing comments. Over to you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, much appreciated for that introduction. Um, as Nancy said, most of us probably think of CIRA as the folks who operate .ca, but we also do a range of other enterprise level uh, services around the DNS, really the underpinning of the internet, the domain name system, the registry, and more and more cybersecurity services. So all things internet. But in addition to all of that, we also manage and fund the community investment program, a fund that includes a $1.25 million annual granting program for digital development projects as well as our support for activities like the Canadian Internet Governance Forum. So first off, I wanna congratulate this year's organizers and participants on another great event. CIRA is proud to be a presenting sponsor and of course, one of the founding members of the CIGF. At CIRA, we are big proponents of multi-stakeholder models for internet governance. We know that diverse perspectives are essential to ensure this global communications network of network meets both the providers and the users' needs and continues to operate in a safe, stable, and secure fashion. This year's CIGF comes as the Canadian government debates legislation that will have significant impact on how we all use and experience the internet. Bill C-10, tabled earlier this month, will empower the CRTC to force global platforms like Netflix to support the production of Canadian content. Bill C-11, which was introduced just a week ago, aims to update our privacy protections for the digital age. And separately, of course, the government just unveiled its much, much awaited $1.75 billion universal broadband fund which aims to connect 98% of Canadians with high-speed broadband by 2026. Flora, like the CIGF, offer important meeting grounds for internet governance stakeholders, experts, and end users to come together and discuss important issues like these and others. There's no doubt that the internet community will be called upon to tackle many of the issues raised over the last 48 hours. So for example, the government has already pledged to tackle hate speech, exploitation, and online harassment by requiring the social media platforms to remove illegal content within 24 hours of being posted online. Those who watched what I thought was a really interesting panel, the Policing the, Policing the Conversation panel, on Tuesday heard representatives from TikTok, Facebook, and civil society discuss what needs to be done to curb abuse and protect the human beings that use this global network. It's perhaps unsurprising that more and more people are interested in the limits of freedom of expression and content moderation online during this moment of tremendous social upheaval. People around the world are grappling with thorny issues like hate, state-sanctioned violence, and political extremism. And the debates are increasingly being played out in the online world. Can our technology actually help us sort through all of this? Freedom of expression is, of course, an extremely important right. But as we enable and protect free speech, we've also enabled and protected some of the worst of humanity. What happens when free, the free speech of some is used to systematically suppress the free speech of others? And entire swaths of internet users of all race, color, sex, religion, no longer feel safe online. Clearly, empowering that kind of abuse was not the intent of the folks and the many people who built and operate the internet. So how do we govern these platforms to ensure that good people aren't being drowned out, hated, or just trolled right off the internet? How do we regulate the internet so it remains the great force for good that it can be and it's compatible with modern society? National and regional 
initiatives like the CIGF can play an important role in developing shared standards for principles like, the fr like freedom of expression. Imagine if these national and regional initiatives could then ladder their work up to larger multi-stakeholder and multilateral processes aimed at defining how technology, how technology platforms can best serve our economy and our society. These principles shared across multiple jurisdictions could form the basis of responsible regulation for and of the internet. Canada, Canada may only have jurisdiction over 37.5 million internet users, but a block of democratic countries like the Five Eyes, maybe minus the US, uh, but New Zealand, Canada, Australia, the UK, that would represent close to 150 million users. All of these jurisdictions singing from the same song sheet could make big tech sit up and take notice. But in the absence of this potential cooperation, we will be closely monitoring Canada's efforts to regulate the tech giants. And when I say we, I mean everybody at the CIGF and the internet end user community. New efforts to protect users' privacy, promote Canadian content, and achieve universal connectivity will see major milestones in the coming year. And I look forward to discussing them and the many other internet issues with you again at our next CIGF. In the meantime, we are pleased to see the wide range of stakeholders that participated in this year's event. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules for yet another video conference. There's no doubt that your engagement yesterday and today will help enrich the debate on the key digital policy questions facing Canadians. Thank you for all of your time, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Bye for now. Thanks, Byron. Next slide, please. Please stick around for today's bonus session. We welcome Katja Meltzer and Antoine Rayru from the Gotha Institute. Katja and Antoine are working on a transatlantic civil society dialogue that brings together Canadians and Europeans to discuss the future of digital inclusion. Thanks so much for being here and over to you, Katja and Antoine. Thank you, Nancy, for the introduction. And um, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are very excited about this opportunity to present the project, Our Digital Future at this year's forum. And um, we would like to thank everyone who's uh, sticking around for this uh, add-on info session um, this early evening, late afternoon. Um, so yes, uh, you mentioned, uh, my name is Katja Mette. I'm the director of the Goethe Institute in Montreal, which is, uh, you might have guessed it by my accent, uh, the German Cultural Institute here in Canada. And uh, we are one of the project initiators. Um, I will basically give a brief overview, uh, give you some context about the project, and then uh, Antoine, who is our political outreach coordinator, will um, present more in detail the methods and process we used uh, and the actual findings of what you think about the digital future. Um, so basically, our digital future, CEC, that's the full title, um, provides a new platform for European and Canadian youth to connect and to exchange about digital world issues, about challenges around digital transformation, and specifically about how to make um, uh, our digital future more inclusive. Um, they are basically invited to, um, to, to yeah, exchange their ideas, but uh, ultimately to also draft policy recommendations and get engaged in policy uh, making processes. Um, we are three main partner organizations. So besides us, there is uh, Think Young, which is a think tank based in Brussels with um, numerous uh, liaison offices around the world. And our Canadian partner, Carrefour Jeunesse Emploi, NDG, uh, which is a Quebec organization um, servicing youth um, here locally. Um, the project is funded, uh, you mentioned it, Nancy, uh, by the European Union as part of the overall program uh, EU-Canada Youth Transatlantic Civil Society Dialogues. We 
started the project last year in uh, early last year and um, we will finalize it um, in March 2021 so it's a little bit more over two years and um, yeah we have a lot of things to to report already since we are nearing um, the end of the project. So essentially the, the project consists of three main actions. The first and the most important is to activate uh, Canadian and European youth to engage in policy making processes, which means we uh, to get acquainted with these pro processes and ultimately um, to create policy recommendations for a more inclusive digital future. The second action is to communicate um, the ideas, concerns, proposals that youth developed to a larger public, um, also both uh, uh, in Europe and in Canada. And uh, third, to um, communicate the policy recommendations drafted to actual policymakers um, in Europe and in Canada. So at, uh, to ensure this, we work with a number of formats and, and um, also with many youth organizations, international youth organizations and other organizations that are um, relevant for the topic. Um, and um, I'm happy to share that up until now, we actively engaged over a thousand youth on, on both sides of the Atlantic to participate in this process and to share their ideas. And now I hand over to Antoine to give more, more details about that. Thank you, Katia. And um, thank you to all again for, yes, for, for sticking around a few more minutes. So um, maybe just a word on the process of building those recommendations. And then I'll just give you a very quick snapshot view uh, of some of those results. No, no, not all of them, but some that I think were also relevant to the discussions that took place in this CIGF uh, for, for the past two days. So um, the process, essentially what we did is that we brought together those young adults and in working group sessions, so uh, quite similar to focus groups, right? So sessions with 10, 12 young adults in different Canadian cities and also the same in, 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 in Europe. I will mostly talk about the, the, the Canadian side. So we did this either for 24 hour long sessions on site and we also did some of those sessions online, of course, not for 24 hours in that case, but like during a full week and with two hour long sessions spread, you know, across across the week. And so then it's a step by step thinking, right? So for to narrow down progressively the initial ideas towards the process of recommendations and also having an, a very, you know, inclusive and collective way of thinking about 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 those. So. Um, I know that, so I'll just give you a hint of some of those results. Um, I have uh, asked Alisa to, uh, to um, put in, you know, in, in the event chats, the link to the project. So if you want to know more about the project, the outcomes, uh, the results, whether it's policy recommendations or videos also that have been, uh, that have been uh, made, you can, you can check out the link. And, and of course, you can uh, touch base with us if you want to know more. So, um, Maybe three quick uh, talking points on, on those uh, recommendations that echo some of what has been discussed uh, lately. So first point, uh, digital literacy, digital literacy education. There was a panel on, on that issue just, just an hour ago. Um, very important issue for our young participants, both on a socioeconomic level, you know, everything that has to do with skills and coding, programming, and also as a civic issue, right, with uh, the development of digital government, anything that has to do with cyber ethics online, so on and so forth. So, of course, one of the main discussion points was how do we uh, increase the number of relevant initiatives at the local level? Uh, how do we provide additional funding? And it was what, what I liked about the content of those discussions that they actually, most of them did not focus that much on regular curriculum, K-12 programming and so on, but mostly on after school, after work programs that would target not just youth, but, but the Canadian population more, more generally. And so, this was raised in particular uh, by, um, by participants in the Vancouver area uh, with the problematic lack of uh, funding, whether it's federal, whether it's provincial. So how do we try to team up with maybe uh, corporate community organizations to try and, 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 and beef up those, those programs that are highly needed? Um, point number two, accessibility. Again, an issue that has been addressed at, at great length uh, for the past two days. And that has been also taken on recently with the federal announcement of the, the Universal Broadband uh, Fund. Um, accessibility here, what I want to highlight is not accessibility just in terms of infrastructures, especially in remote communities, you know, rural communities, uh, amongst indigenous communities. We all know that this is 
very significant issue. You have to bear in mind also that this project is a Canada-Europe project and actually the lack of reliable infrastructure and access to high-speed, good quality internet is a very, very much a Canadian issue. You know, you wouldn't find anything that comes close to the problematic situation in Europe, even if you go to remote communities in Europe, in, in the north of Europe, uh, it's nowhere close to the problems that, that we face in, in, in Canada. So um, with this universal broadband fund, there, there are, of course, a series of measures that have been taken by the federal governments lately, uh, with some funds earmarked for, for indigenous communities. But one thing that has been highlighted by our participants also is that it's not just about infrastructure, it's also about um, the cost, you know, cost of subscribing to, uh, to data plans, uh, whether it's on your cell phone, whether it's at, at home. So what is also needed is, is to get access to some maybe rebates, ways of bringing prices down for, for some communities that are less well off in order to have access also to those reliable data. So that's point number two. And third and finally, uh, data privacy. Uh, again, keep in mind that's a Canada Europe project. And one thing that I found and that we found uh, together with the project partners very interesting in, in this project is how young Canadian adults were very much inspired by what was going on in Europe with uh, data protection regulations, uh, data privacy laws that uh, are probably more advanced than, than what we find in Canada or that maybe what we found until recently. Um, now is the time, of course, of implementing the Digital Charter uh, Act and, and, you know, parliamentary debates were kicked off actually yesterday on, 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 this, on, on those new bills. Um, a lot of this, the discussions brought by our participants had to do with, um, you know, having a Canadian equivalent to the right to be forgotten, right? So how you can dispose of your data, um, what happens with your footprint or digital identity once you're diseased, for example, once you pass away, uh, how can we impose uh, bigger regulations on how big tech companies use, sell uh, data? And so all of this is part of the current debate. Uh, the considerations, and since now is the time of, of this uh, legislative uh, discussions, the uh, the time for action is, is actually now. So, so we're also very interested to see how we could push for more stringent regulations on on in, in that in that area. So, again, that is just a, a very quick snapshot view on the project. I don't want to take too much time because it's you know it's it's the end of two days of you know uh, uh, long and, and rich discussions already. Um, I will just pause for a second just to check in case if uh, there are uh, audience questions. I will add before we, uh, before we, uh, we finish the session a word on what's coming next because the project is not over yet. Uh, but let me just uh, check if uh, we do have questions. Uh, okay, what are some major differences between Canadian <laughs> and European attitudes are Canadians similar <laughs> to Americans. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words and, and Katia, if you want to add something, mm -hmm. feel, feel free to. Um, well, actually, going, going back to data privacy, that's, that's one thing that I found interesting. You know, we, uh, when you think about GDPR, data privacy, there's, all, uh, there's usually the, a kind of thinking that everything that has to do with right to free speech and so on is a very typical American thing and probably that explains in part why the Canadian regulation in the sense of a North American system is closer to you know, the individual free speech and the importance of having that uh, you know, available information online uh, without constraints, whereas Europeans have probably moved forward faster in terms of um, protect protecting some of those data uh, also from the public sphere. So that's one thing that certainly I, you know, we have experienced in, in, in the discussion. And so everything that has to do with privacy, I, you know, I think we could very clearly see a distinction in, in maybe, maybe in, in, in attitudes. Um, that's, that's the one thing that comes on, on top of my mind. I don't know if Katia, you have something else you wanted to add in? Yeah. yeah. I think um, I think that's a good point you mentioned. Um, I think um, otherwise there are a lot of um, similarities in this generation. So we are t we are talking to people they are between eighteen and thirty years old, and I have to say that uh, so far the concerns are very very similar. Um, perhaps we used as a matter because it's such a big topic, digital inclusion, uh, we basically broke it down to um, subtopics uh, that young people can relate to. And I have to say that in terms of um, 
for example, topics like racism and um, inclusion, um, you know, of different, um, you, you mentioned, um, Antoine, that there are populations that are more poor than others. I think there's a bigger sensibility about that in Canada um, than in Europe. Um, we can also see that with, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement that started later um, in Europe. Um, so there, I think Canada is, is more advanced. And I think um, that's the nice thing about it, that both really learn from each other through this exchange. Mm -hmm. And we have another question. Did you look at the right to be forgotten, which is very unique in Europe? Yeah, maybe Antoine, you want to mention something? Yes. So again, that is, uh, I, you know, so, so having moderated some of those like working group sessions, I was actually quite interested to see that, um, well, maybe just to do, you know, just, just a side note, we come to those discussions with a very, uh, in a very open-minded way. So we don't impose any topics for discussions beforehand right so we just see what what comes out of the concerns that are voiced by by our young participants and 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 actually i i could see that in almost all of those meetings this is an issue that would that would arise at some point in the conversation right so oh why is it that that that, that europeans have this right to be forgotten and that we don't have it here in canada uh, so indeed that is you know a very unique thing I think that I, you know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, an, an expert in, in in this new digital charter implementation act and what it entails. I think some provisions are coming closer to a Canadian equivalent to the right to be forgotten. Uh, we are not there yet, but what I found certainly interesting is that there was very little from our Canadian participants, very little interventions or people who would say, oh, but wait, no, this is, this is not a, a good thing. This is something that we should be very wary about. The general feeling was very much, we should have something like that in, in Canada as well. Um, so something that gives us more control over what, what can or cannot be on the internet when you uh, Google me up, uh, what can appear or not. Uh, so there was a general sense that, that you know, this, this was a good thing that, 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 we, that Europeans had and that Canadians didn't have. So. Okay, um, I can see there aren't any additional questions now. So I just wanted to add before, uh, uh, before we go that the, the project is still ongoing, right? So it continues until early 2021. It got extended a little bit for reasons that you probably all, all know about and that have affected us, us all. So if you, again, if you check out the link that Elsa provided in the chat, uh, you can check the results, but you can also still even sign up until December 1, actually. So if you um, are age between 18 and 30, if you know people around you that are interested in being part of, of the online challenges that remain, uh, you can do so. You can build a team and you can, you can be part of the project. So I really encourage you to, to, to check it out or, or to reach out to us if you are interested and, 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 and want to uh, join. Um, Katya, do you want to have the last word? Thank you, Antoine. Uh, yes, I also want to promote one of our outreach events. So um, I mentioned before, we do a couple of uh, different things, internal um, hackathon uh, sessions and uh, mentorship programs and others and um, as part of our public outreach we also organize a speaker series and the next one will take place on December 7 of course online um, at a time that is uh, convenient both in Canada and Europe uh, it's uh, 12 uh, p.m. Montreal time uh, or Eastern Day time um, and it's about uh, gender equality and digital inclusion so the titles mind the gender gap and um, yes, we would be happy if uh, some of you, all of you would join. Um, so we get the hint that uh, it's the last word of the conference. I think Antoine, I, I give back to you. <laughs> um, well, so thank you again for, you know, for taking the time to, to be there uh, with us. We're, we're really uh, happy that we got the chance to tell you a little bit about, about this uh, uh, really fascinating project that, that we've been so interested in, in, you know, in implementing. So, uh, thank you again to all, and uh, I uh, wish you uh, wish you all a very nice evening, night, morning. I don't know who's who in, in the world right now. So, uh, uh, so thank you all again.